Extra, extra, read all about it. DFF opens vault, allows plebs to see small sampling of patron goodness. Yeah, today we're going to open up the vault. We're going to show you guys an episode called Kurt Cobain. This was a, we each did an episode about our favorite uh, musician. I was about Marilyn Manson. Uh, Scotty's was about David Bowie. And Paul's was about Kurt Cobain, but his was the one that ended up on the other side of the paywall. So I figure it's it's about time that it become available for you plebs as well. You know, uh, so here it is. DFF number 40. Kurt Cobain. But first, before you watch this, remember this and tons more content like it. Uh, this well, this is now available to you. But prior to this, I mean, it was originally we did this on a. Uh, June 1st, 2018. You guys had to wait years before you could see this. And there's tons more episodes like it on the other side of the Patreon paywall. Maybe that maybe you guys don't like the term paywall, but that's just honest, right? It is a paywall. It's a wall. You got to pay to get on the other side. Just pay. It's really not that expensive. Come on. Join us. We deserve it more than freaking Netflix or some fucking evil corporation, right? You know? We're just three guys. I mean, sure, <laughs> we're all evil too, but like, you know, uh, better to give it to just three evil everyday dudes rather than a giant corporation full of evil people, right? Makes sense to me. Anyway, here's Kurt Cobain. Check it the fuck out. What a majestic bunch of fucking heroes. <clears throat> Wait a minute. What is happening here? What? What? <sighs> you guys are off to one fucking side like crazy. Well, what the fuck? I didn't touch the goddamn thing. Fucking obviously. Well, whose Paul, desk it's on? You were probably rampaging. Here, Paul, take this fucking scepter. You were probably rampaging or something late at night in one of your many, many drunken tirades down here, TJ. Oh, fuck. My mic was off that whole goddamn time. <laughs> Welcome to Deep Fat Fried, everybody. Where Paul's mic is off. Where the Paul's mic off. is off and the camera's fucked up. God damn it. The camera's fucked up and the mic is off. God, you what look. you gonna do? I feel something weird, man. Oh, dude. I don't, I don't, I don't you all right there, Scotty? I don't, I don't you don't feel so good? God, dude. Oh, man, are you going to throw up? So What's he doing? Scotty's pulling his dick out. What? The stream. What the fuck? Whoa. Oh. Hey, TJ. Yeah, what's that? TJ. What? Play. Oh, good. You saved me the trouble of finding that bat. Dude, it's happening. Let me we got the bats. Let me examine that bat, Scotty. Bring the bat for us so I could see if it is acceptable. He just wants to sniff it because it was down in your pants. That's fucking disgusting. Let's see. So the bat <laughs> on the show that he had, the width of the bat was not even wider than two fingers. Let's see if this passes that test. Yep. Yeah, it does. Oops. Uh-oh. Let's see. Oh, what the, what is the, what's the length of this bat, Scotty? Is uh, this 16 inches? I believe it is, yeah. Yeah, it looks about that. It's about as big as my dick. <laughs> 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 TJ, 
You by far the smallest penis here. Yeah. I mean by far. By far. I don't know, dude. dude. Hey, I don't know. Man, it, it's, it's a grower, man. It's a grower, not a shower. It, it goes from like hey, the this size of the ship to like it's the most there. Shower, you know? <laughs> Gross, man. A day in the life of teacher. A day in the life. Scotty's mic is off? I don't think it is. No, dude. No? No. They're just trolling. Fuck them. Is it, is it on? Is it off? So, check, check. One, two. All right, Paul, you're too loud. Hold on. Well, turn me the fuck down then. What's I'm the f- doing it. I didn't want you to turn you on, dude. You said that earlier. You're too loud, Paul. Be quiet. Yeah, we had, uh, we were doing some work on our board, so now all the settings are fucked up. Of course. Of course. Set up a new board though soon. So. Yeah. Hopefully, this will iron out any audio issues we have going forward. Yep. It has been ordered. Things should be sounding better relatively soon. In the meantime, old incompetent TJ will <laughs> muddle his way through it. Oh, TJ. Dead guy. What's his name? Dirt. Hold on. I, I took notes on tonight's show. Right. Kurt. Cobin? I don't even know. Is it Co Coba Cobain? Is he Spanish? Oh Cobain. Cobain. Kurt Donald Cobain. Who's a guy apparently a musician that we're gonna learn about today. Kids That's... we're gonna learn about music. I even have notes. I'm so prepared we have notes, guys. Holy shit. Scotty's got notes. Damn dude, I got yeah, a lot of notes. There's, a, there's notes. a lot of fucking notes, dude, there's yeah. There's a lot of fucking notes. All right. Yeah. I think I got everyone's volume to a reasonable place. Oh, you place. actually have done your fucking job for once. Oh, yes. Wow. Congratulations, TJ. Yes. <clears throat> so, uh, no, we're talking about Kurt, uh, Kurt Cobain tonight, yeah? Kurt yes. Cobain. That's Kurt how it's it, pronounced. Kurt it Cobain. Kurt. Yeah. Kurt, Kurt it. Donald Cobain, who uh, was born in, in, in Washington in 1967. A little small, little log in town. Mill in town. Yep. Uh, what was it? Town. It was uh, what was the name of the town? Aberdeen. Yeah, Aberdeen. Aberdeen, Washington. You know, it's Aberdeen. funny because he never fit in there, and now I think there's like a sign. It's like Kurt Cobain's from here. You there's know? a bunch of signs actually. They ab- there's an Aberdeen Kurt Cobain Memorial Council. Yeah. Um, and when you're driving into Aberdeen, Washington, there's a sign that says "Welcome to Aberdeen. Come as you are." <laughs> and go. it's funny because like you know <laughs> when he was there, no one gave a flying fuck about his ass. Yeah. And now they got the, the town is like, yeah, our national fucking treasure. Well, fame tends to do that. Yeah. Um, so his parents, Wendy Elizabeth Freidenberg, a waitress. And Donner, Donald Leland Cobain, auto mechanic. So humble, yeah. humble uh, background. Uh, I think I pulled a picture of little Kurt with his parents. Right. Wanna, yeah, I got it. Hold yeah. on. Yeah, if you want to show the people that yeah, picture. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's Take a look. Kurt. Take a look at Kurt it. Yeah, blow it up a little bit for us there, TJ. I am doing so. Cool. Yeah, look at little Kurt. Little Kurt. So kind of a dorky dad. Very uh, 1960s, 1950s looking dad and mom. Interesting fact, uh, Kurt Cobain was born on February 20th, 1967, and TJ... What day were you born, buddy? February Whoa. 20th, 1985. Whoa, dude. Wow, I didn't know you shared a birthday with Kurt Cobain. Yeah, me and Kurt have the same birthday. Wow, you, you're literally the living embodiment of everything he was then. Yes, 100%, except better, <laughs> you know. Oh, better in every way? Taller, faster, stronger. I noticed Kurt also looks a lot like his fucking dad. Uh, yeah, he kind of does. Uh, didn't get his dad's big Dumbo ears, so thanks, Mom, for that. So actually, I don't know. kind of looks like know, he yeah, did. He kind of does there as the kid. You can see he's got some That's probably why ears. he grew his hair out. Yeah, maybe <laughs> so that's he, why he, he always the, uh, had the long hair. Yeah, he does have Dumbo ears. Uh, so he's the first grandchild on either side of the family. So very early on, he was like the center of attention in this family. Right. Very, very energetic child. You know, like that was a, a story that uh, I watched... Um, I'm sure you guys have probably seen this if you're a Kurt Cobain fans. Montage of Hack. Yeah. Yep. Well, they describe him as just being a million miles an hour. Like, he's sitting on the back of his mom's rocking chair, singing the Sesame Street song, like, very musically inclined. Yep. This totally empathetic, you know, little kid just kind of always concerned about those around him. So, according to his Aunt Mary, he began singing at the age of two. At age four, he started uh, playing the piano and singing. Yeah. Uh, writing a song about a trip to the local park, <clears throat> I guess. 
He listened to artists like the Ramones and Electric Light Orchestra, and from a young age would sing songs like Ardo Guthrie's Motorcycle Song, the Beatles' Hey Jude, Terry Jack's Seasons, uh, Seasons in the Sun. So clearly he had a, uh, some parents that cared about him and let him listen to some good music at least, um, at least early in his life. Um, he was described as a happy-go-lucky kid, full of energy like Scotty said, um, and really fascinated by art. His inclination towards art was evident from his drawings of cartoon characters on his room on, on his room walls, like Donald Duck. I think I pulled some uh, some, some pictures drawings. Of his, yeah, and if you go to the drawings part of yeah, those pictures, a, we got um, some drawings in here. I think some of them are some of his. Yeah, these are his. So that's that's labeled age six. So that's pretty. It's pretty good for a six year old. Hell yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so displayed an early aptitude for art and creativity and music and kind of carried all of that through his whole life. So kind of similar to Manson in that I mean, way. he's trying to like, even though he's only six here, like he's trying to do perspective and shit. Now he's not necessarily doing the greatest job, but I mean, for a six, six year old, it's pretty fucking, pretty fucking I couldn't solid. do much better than that. I'm a fucking adult dude. Yeah. So apparently his childhood room was plastered with these. Dude, look at fucking Fred Flintstone's yeah, Fred. freakish fucking long ass arm there. And look at look at the look on his face too. <laughs> he must have realized that Fred Flintstone probably didn't feel the way he was portrayed in the comics. <laughs> you know, we're in a goddamn factory all day. Yeah, is- he's a soulless fucking drone in this one. Whoa, dude. Damn, Charlie Brown is fucking evil, dude. He's is he like fucking is he choking Snoopy Snoopy's to death? Snoopy's like his little BDSM bitch. It's like a slave. I'm trying to like, rah, ha, ha, ha. you're my slave, Snoopy. I know it's him just walking the dog. So, oh, this is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Kurt. Uh, Kurt had uh, family members that were artists and musicians as well. Uh, he had an uncle who was in a band called the Beachcombers, which yeah. is a, a an early punk band. Um, his great uncle Delbert was an Irish tenor who was in a bunch of Hollywood movies. Yeah, um, sang in a bunch of stuff. And his grandmother, Iris, was a big influence on him, was a visual artist. And I so think- basically, that like, came from a, a family with a pedigree of like artists and yes. shit. Yeah. You know, not, he, he's not like, uh, you know, the black sheep in that family necessarily in that sense. No. And I think, Paul, we, we kind of have to go there early on, you know, also a pedigree for. Suicide. Well, yeah, I mean, artistic people. Art- I mean, I know you're already building your case, Scotty. And we're not even, like, we're going to cover I'm that. I'm just saying, Paul. But that's I'm just this saying. Is- hey, right. Paul, you don't like facts? You don't like facts, do you, buddy? All right, all right. We'll talk about facts later. We'll talk about facts. But, yeah, up until about the age of nine, Kurt's childhood was pretty idyllic. He had a pretty good childhood. His mom and dad loved him, took care of him. He was exposed to lots of art and lots of music and lots of culture. And then his parents got a divorce. And like it happens in so many families, his whole life fell apart. I mean, it's a, it's a pivotal moment in his life. Yep. I mean, it really is. It's something that just would affect the entire course of the 27 years he was on this planet. Was this kind of yearning <laughs> to have this nuclear family unit, you know, to have this just... Everyone's like, you know, the mom and the dad, and he has a sister, and it's just going to be great. They're a happy-go-lucky family, and just he didn't get it. He, and he actually had a lot of problems after that. He started acting out. He just couldn't – he just really couldn't control his emotions about what was going on in his life. So I pulled a quote from an interview that he gave about this, and I'll read it here. He says, uh, I remember feeling ashamed for some reason. I was ashamed of my parents for – I couldn't face some of my friends at school anymore because I wanted – I desperately wanted to have the classic, you know, typical family, mother, father. I wanted that security. So I resented my parents for quite a few years because of that. And uh, I think that's uh, putting it kind of like lightly. Um, He talks uh, a little bit in that same interview about his relationship with his father. And this is a pretty long quote, but I think it's pretty interesting and kind of reveals a lot about him. He, uh, by the way, when the divorce happened was sent to live with his dad. His mother didn't have custody of him. His dad did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which they, they posit, uh, she posits basically that she could not really handle Kurt's acting out. And it might have been true. His mother was not a, the most stable person in the family. No, not by a long shot. <laughs> but um, Kurt had this to say about his father. He said, well, I've always kept a relationship with my mom because she's always been the more affectionate one. My father, I haven't talked to him for about 10 years now, up until this last year where he sought me out backstage 
at a show we played in Seattle. And for a long time, I always wanted him to know that uh, I don't hate him anymore. I just don't have anything to say to him. I don't want to have a relationship with a person just because they're my blood relative. They bore me. My father is incapable of showing me much affection or even carrying on a conversation. So just because of the last time I saw him, I expressed this to him and it made and made it really clear to him that I just didn't want anything to do with him anymore. But it was a relief on both of our parts, you know, because for so many years he felt that I really hated his guts. So Kurt estranged from his dad, even though his mother was unstable, in fact, too unstable to care for him as a child. Um, had quite a bit of resentment for his father. Um, I think a lot of it might have stemmed from the fact that he was an only child and his father made a promise to him when he was young, when the divorce happened, that he would never remarry. Which, of course, he he did. And, of course, he did. And not only did he remarry, but he had a child, uh, another little brother for Kurt. Well, actually, Kurt wasn't an only child. He had a a sister. He was the only son. And he felt that connection with his parents. And then when his dad remarried and his mom remarried, both of his parents ended up remarrying. Um, he felt betrayed by them, um, both of them, really, and estranged from them. He felt like he wasn't special anymore. And, you know, as a kid that was grown up, talented, around a bunch of talented people, he was always told, you're special, you're special, you're special. And then at nine years old, he realizes, you know, what we all have to come to realize at one point, which is, oops, uh oh, shit, I'm not. I'm not special. And yeah. I think he kind of resented his parents for that. I mean, I think you have to put it in the perspective of a child that he's nine years old. He doesn't really understand why his parents are divorced. You know, a lot of times kids blame themselves. And I mean, it, he was a very emotional, empathetic <coughs> child. So like to him, it hit him so hard. that He just couldn't get why his family couldn't be together. He, could, he didn't understand why things didn't just work. And, yeah. you know, and like you said, you know, the realization that you're just another fucking cog in the goddamn machine of life. You you're not anything special. You're not anything important. You're just you. You're this person. You're here for how, who knows how long, and then you're gone, and that's it. Yeah. Uh, Kurt also, uh, when he was very young, witnessed his mother's physical abuse at the hands of her second husband, which pushed him further into depression, as one would imagine. Uh, his mother refused to report the abuse and remained committed to the relationship. So that was another thing that estranged him from his mother, Um, just the violence that was going on in her house and her unwillingness to stand up for herself. Um, So as a result of all this broken home nonsense that happens to so many fucking kids, uh, Kurt became more and more rebellious as a teenager, um, so much so that his father uh, couldn't deal with him. Uh, His dad threw his hands up in the air and would send him to live with friends and family members for extended periods of time uh, to try and preserve peace in the house amongst his wife and their new child. Um, uh, Kurt was just loud and obnoxious and rebellious and boisterous and uh, defiant to a fucking T. Because I think he had just, you know, he'd found out that the whole family unit thing that he had loved so much when he was a kid was total fucking horse shit. And he wasn't having it anymore. Um, so uh, one of the places that he was sent uh, to live with was the parents of his friend Jesse Reed from school. Uh, while he was living with Reed, whose family was a bunch of hardcore evangelical Christians, Kurt became uh, a devout Christian himself, uh, regularly attending church services and uh, weaving a lot of Christian symbology into his art. That started to so, happen. So he, so he kind of oscillates between trying to conform to what everyone expects of him. He was looking for stability. Yeah. And he saw this family that was super religious, and they're like, Heidi Ho, Kurt, come on. We got a bed for you and here. He's like, I, this is what I need. This is what I and need to like, find that, I want. The, my and, pe- the, the, the pe- like He was trying to find some inner peace. Right. Um, so He was trying to find that familial connection that he fe- felt yeah. like he lost. So then he saw, oh, wait, this religion is really bringing this family together, which is right. what I want for yeah, my that, family. That's the formula for success, obviously. My family's not like this, so this is the formula that's going to yeah, make it, me Yeah, it must be religion that's holding them together yeah. like this. He would you know? later in his life denounce Christianity, but he remained a devout Christian all the way up until uh, the founding of Nirvana and the release of Nirvana's first album. He was still uh, a Christian, so it's kind of a little-known fact about Kurt. Um, uh, let's see. The song Lithium from Nevermind was written about his time living with the Reeds. And, uh, I pulled some lyrics here. I won't, I won't do him the disservice of singing them, but it's, uh, 
everybody who's listening to Nirvana probably knows these. I'm so happy because today I found my friends. They're in my head. I'm so ugly, but that's okay because so are you. We've broken our mirrors. Scotty, you have, a, you have a pretty terrible singing voice. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you sing it? Yeah, sing it, Scotty. <laughs> I'm so happy because today I found my friends. They're in my head. <laughs> I'm so ugly, but that's okay. <laughs> so are you. Oh, oh my God. Oh. I'm not going to do any more to disservice. Broken our mirrors. Sunday morning is every day for all I care, and I'm not scared. Light my candles in a daze because I've found God. So that was written about his time with the Reeds. See, I never knew that. Later in his life. I never knew that. Yeah, obviously, that's a more cynical take on that time. Because yeah, obviously, so at the time, see, he was super into it. Oh, yeah. But, but when here he he's talking about being them, in a fucking daze of uh, you know religion. Uh, in high school, Kurt was not a great student, but he continued to show aptitude in art and music. Um, he played drums in the band. He took art classes. Uh, Kurt would often draw during school classes as part of the enjoyment of creating visual art, according to him. I love that, too. Um, he would draw objects, including those associated with the human anatomy. Uh, he was given a character assignment for an art course, and he drew Michael Jackson. And I think I pulled these I, uh, pictures. We have uh, these pictures. So this yeah, is Michael a- Jackson is number 15 on this list. God damn it. I just fucking closed it in. Hold on. That's all right. Just uh, you can go ahead and talk about it. Incompetent up in a TJ. So anyway, he drew a uh, he drew a, a a portrait of Michael Jackson, but he got told by the teacher that the image was inappropriate for a school hallway, and we'll take a look at why. Uh, so as a makeup, he drew an image of President uh, Ronald Reagan uh, that was also rejected due to being seen as quote unquote unflattering. So either. sorry, runs in here very early on. Uh, so this is um, yeah, it's number. F- the, uh, this is number 14. fifteen here, yeah. or fourteen. Let me yeah, see. Yeah, so that can... this is the portrait that he did of Michael Jackson that was rejected. As you can see, Michael Jackson doing what he always did, grabbing his crotch and gyrating. And how old was he at this uh, time? Uh, he was a teenager, I'm, I'm early teens, so thirteen or fourteen so years he, old. He runs into the classic day in school, which is like express yourself. You really need to express yourself and show who you are as a person. And then when you do, they're like, ah. no. Oh, did that happen to me in school? I wrote not a story. like that. Yeah, you know, I wrote a story about these kids finding like uh, going to a school trip and they find like ancient weapons and destroy a school bus with yeah. them. It was just some stupid fucking story, and the teacher's like, this story is inappropriate. It's like, why? Because the kids destroy the school bus. It's like... Fuck you. Well, How this dare was a, you a express creative writing that. assignment, so... How is it unusual or wrong? Like, so he, he submitted this for this, uh, what he is submitted it? submitted this. It Portrait was contest. Because it was inappropriate. Because he's and grabbing then, his dick. Which is yeah, if you close It kind of looks like he's jerking off, you know? It kind of does. Number 14, yeah, that's Ronnie Reagan. Dude. So this was his makeup Hi, assignment. Hi, Reagan! And uh, they called it, quote, unquote, unflattering. You can see the monkey Sieg Heiling. <laughs> Apparently this was auctioned on eBay, too. Uh, yeah, it in, was. In 2004, so yeah. a while ago. Um, but yeah, he was a freshman in high school when he drew these. So you can see Kurt had already kind of developed this rebellious counterculture kind of attitude at an early age as a teenager. In addition to all the angst from his parents breaking up and his horrible home life and shit. Well, I mean, I think it's only natural. It's like, you know, that's always an outlet for a lot of teenagers and, you know, children. They, they act out to get attention. And, I mean, obviously, the, his opinion, especially as he, as he got older, was like, this is all bullshit. This is all stupid. This is all a waste of time. It's phony. It's fake. And, has not, and it's nothing that I really want to be a part of. Pretty good likeness of Reagan there, though. Yeah, yeah. You de- I mean, you could definitely see. That he, I mean, he you know who it is. Improved as an artist. Oh, for sure. And he's got Bubbles the monkey with him, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, Kurt claims that the first concert that he ever saw was the Melvins, uh, which is a Seattle punk band as a teenager. Uh, this has been disputed by different members of his family after his death, saying that they remember him going to concerts as a kid to different places, Sammy Hagar and shit. Um, but Kurt, an, Kurt, was kind of, the Hagar, Kurt was kind of known for uh, mythologizing his own past and the I mean, first uh, band that he see, wanted I mean, to I think I, that we, he we saw. See, we see a lot of fucking uh, similarities here between him and Manson. Some differences, too. But oh, like, of course. The, I mean, if this, you look at some this, of his paintings, because we really won't be talking about his paintings. But yeah, I mean, like the fact that uh, he also chose to work in uh, watercolor. Yeah, a lot of watercolor paintings, and some of it is some of the media. Uh, some of this imagery is very similar. Some of it's very placid and classical, and some of it's very dark. Um, you know, so he had a this kind of wild swing of styles and 
that was cool. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. He he really liked drawing uh, wrinkly faces. Yeah. See, that's this is very like Mansonish right, right here. I mean, like you know, it's kind of cool to see like the similarities in two artists that kind of emerged around the same time. Um, yeah. You know, and uh, you know, they're both attracted to art. Uh, I think Manson had a better relationship with his parents than Kurt did, but it sounds you know, like by, it, by yeah. far. Then again, his his parents never divorced. When his mom died, his his, his parents were still together. Uh, kind of kind of interesting stuff, though. Um, but yeah, anyway, you were, you were so talking about so in the about mythology the, uh, of his life, self mythologizing. Yeah, um, on his 14th birthday, on February 20th, 1981, his uncle offered him a deal: he could either have a bike or a used guitar. Kurt chose the guitar. And uh, pretty soon he was trying to learn songs that he loved from his childhood. Queen and Led Zeppelin and uh, the cars he was into. Um, and it wasn't long before he started writing his own songs and poetry and lyrics. Um, despite being right-handed, he played the guitar left-handed. That's so he, weird. Why? Uh, nobody really knows. Um he was just more comfortable playing that way. He might, it might have just been the way he learned it. He might have just yeah. taught himself that I way. I mean, his uncle didn't offer him guitar lessons. He offered him a fucking yeah, guitar. Yeah, so he might have just... So he might have just picked it up and started learning and then had learned too much to f correct it and just decided, fuck it, I'll just learn it this way. Uh, I don't know. I couldn't find any... Uh, maybe there's something out there of him talking about it, but I, I looked briefly and couldn't find anything. Interesting. Um, he was also kind of an outcast at school. Um, mostly because of his friends, not himself. Um, when he was a, a young teenager, he befriended a gay student at a school and suffered bullying uh, from students uh, who thought that he was gay because of who he hung out with. Right. Um, I got a, an interview quote here. He said that he liked being associated with a gay identity because he did not like people, and when they thought he was gay, they left him alone. <laughs> uh, he also stated, uh, I started seeing, uh, being really proud of the fact that I was gay, even though I wasn't. <laughs> uh, the friend that he had at high school while he was a young teen tried to kiss him one time, and Kurt backed away, uh, explaining to his friend that he was not gay, but would remain friends with him. Um, here's another interview clip. Um, he claimed, uh, Kurt claimed that he was gay in spirit and probably could be bisexual, whatever that means. <laughs> I probably could. You know be. what? This, <laughs> his gay friend, you know, I mean, it's cool that Kurt would befriend him and shit. But yeah. That was like, that guy must have felt hardcore fucking friend zoned, dude. Oh, bad. Oh, dude. <laughs> you know, it must have been harsh. <laughs> um, he also stated that he used spray paint to spray uh, God is gay on pickup the trucks. And lyrics that appeared area. in his albums later, you know. Right. Uh, but once again, this is one of his claims that I couldn't find anything to back up. There is an incident of him being arrested, though, for spray painting in Aberdeen. And the phrase he spray painted was, ain't got no how whatchamacallit. <laughs> and he sprayed it on the side of vehicles. That's awesome. Um, one of his personal journal states, I am not gay, although I wish I were, just to piss off homophobes. <laughs> so, pretty cool quote there. So, I mean, like, he had a really interesting relationship with, like, uh, homosexuality being, like, a straight dude. Yeah. Um, kind, kind of. of just I mean, the I area just, that he lived in was one of the most progressive areas. I mean, it still remains one of the most progressive areas. I mean, obviously, it, was, it wasn't. I mean, it, was, it wasn't progressive enough that. Sure, he wasn't, but in, he was, in comparison to other places. Right. It was still, you know, the, the undercurrent of liberalism had already taken root in, in Seattle by the time he was a teenager. Right, right. Um, a big time. But I think it's so, kind of interesting that he, he kind of. Uh, identified with the outsider like i feel like uh, if you really read a lot about kurt there's this 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 trend in him where it's like he's really rebelling more against himself than anybody else because it's like he wants rock and roll success but he feels ashamed for wanting it you know he wants this you know family unity traditional kind of thing but at the same time he kind of rebels against it by well, yeah, identifying a, with the outsiders and the fringe of, of society business. and it continues on throughout his life and i mean it, it it's even the media he consumed you know when we get to, into the albums maybe a little bit more we'll, we can talk more about that uh i think a big thing too in this time to note is that 
he was really just starting to get into marijuana. Like he loved smoking pot. He thought that that would be kind of an escape for him. Like, and at first it really did feel good for him. Like that was kind of a way he dealt with his problems. Like, oh, let's get high. But eventually even that just started to fail to work for him. Yeah. Well, here's the thing about Kurt's. Kurt had this undiagnosed stomach problem his entire life. And there are with now that we know that Kurt was fond of mythologizing his life. There are several theories about what could have been going on because Kurt, when he died, still there was no hard diagnosis for what he had in his gut. Well, it's even it's even in his quote unquote suicide note, as you would say. Right. Some of his quote unquote friends, which I don't know if I'd call them as friends at this point, backbiting him after his death. I mean, who cares if it was true or not at this point? He's he's dead, but have come out and said that Kurt never had a stomach problem, that he just used that as an excuse to get high. So he would say, oh, man, my stomach hurts so bad. I need this weed. That was always his excuse to be constantly smoking. And then when he graduated to heroin, it became his excuse. Oh, man, heroin's the only thing that kills this gut thing, man. But he just never, it was never diagnosed. Nobody knows exactly what was wrong with him. Now, it's very likely or maybe maybe even possible that fucking Kurt had some kind of undiagnosed stomach. He might have had ulcers or some shit. But, you know, I feel... I mean, pain certainly does drive a lot of people into... Sure, but he had a lot of psychological pain. And I think that that was probably more at the... You know, from all accounts from his friends and family, you know, he did suffer with upper respiratory problems his whole life. That was a constant and ongoing thing. But that's not something you you exactly, you know, get on horse for. I mean, a lot of people that have depression and anxiety also experience the constant nausea, too. Yeah. (coughs) Um... So, I mean, it is possible that it could just be, you know... Could a, be stress-related. Yeah, stress-related, a mental illness. It could be... I mean, it could have been a physical ailment. We it don't really know. It could have been. I just wanted to give both sides of the coin, because there are people that have been close to him that have come out and said, no, 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 it was just a cover for his use. I mean, how I mean, how could anyone really know what's going on, though, right. you know? Sure. Unless he, unless someone's like, he outright confessed to it, me he doesn't It's just have. one of those things, knowing how he's mythologized his past, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along... Um, you know, you got to give a little credence to it. It might have been right. something that he wanted people to think about him. Because I mean, like when you know, like when you have these these people who are like really consummate artists and shit, they're not content with their real biography. You know, a they, lot of times they're not. They Some want, of them are very intensely sure. focused on it. But a lot of a lot of times they want to rewrite their history to fit whatever mythology they've built around themselves and give themselves a background that's more suited to whatever they think they are or whatever they represent you know so, so you know you you can't you you can't really take anything uh you know he says you, you have to put it all with a grain of salt well, absolutely i mean that's true but at the same time you know you're getting interviewed by all these people you're, you're just gonna start you're just gonna start just telling them bullshit whatever you think whatever comes off the top of your head or just what you think might appeal to that person or what you just, you know, in that, in that moment, you want to say. I mean, you know how that goes. Like, sometimes you're talking to people, you lie. We, I mean, we talked about, you know, the the 12-hour stream. People lie all the time. It's not like it's... Oh, of course. That, it's like that's really absurd. You know, you're talking to someone you don't know. They're interviewing you, and you're just like, yeah, I did this, or I did that. What does it really matter? So, more chaos in his life. His sophomore year, he goes to live with his mother. And there's not a whole lot known about this period, other than it was chaotic and frustrating for him. Uh, two weeks prior to graduation, he dropped out of Aberdeen High School, uh, realizing that he just didn't have enough credits to graduate. And his mom gave him a choice, the same choice my dad gave me, which was uh, go back go back to school, find employment, or get the fuck out of the house. Uh, after a week, he, uh, he found his clothes packed, his other belongings and boxes and shit, and uh, he was basically banished from his mom's house. And uh, this is part of his life that's got a lot of heavy mythologizing in. Um, he was homeless and kind of couch surfing for a while. Um, he claims that he lived under a bridge over the Wishkaw River. Should uh, we have a picture of that bridge? Right. This bridge here. Um, however, Nirvana bassist uh, Chris Novoselic said later, he hung out there, but you couldn't live on those muddy banks with the tides coming up and down. That was his own revisionism. Yeah, I mean, that's, pro- that, that's pretty much one that's been widely debunked. So there's actually another um, picture of this bridge that I think is kind of cool. It's just another example of Kurt stuff around Aberdeen. Underneath this bridge 
It says in memoriam from the money muddy banks of the Wishka, which was a posthumous album of live cuts of different songs from different albums um, that was released from the muddy banks of the Wishka. It, it's called so pretty cool. Yeah, something in the way, which is a song that was supposedly written about his time under this bridge, is a pretty awesome song. Dude. Yep pretty awesome so uh is it likely that he slept under that bridge for an extended period of time no is it po- is it possible that he uh, uh spent a lot of time there uh used a lot of drugs there absolutely oh yeah i'm sure almost probably, certainly i mean probably, you know a go-to spot to get high i mean in t- i grew up in a shit little town and every shit little town has a spot like this out of the public eye nobody fucks with you you go to smoke weed or drink or do whatever you want to do and be alone um, so it sounds like this was his spot, which is kind of cool. Yeah, and I'm sure he, I mean, he, he's not romanticizing this place out of nothing. I mean, he he might not have lived under that bridge, but I'm sure he spent a lot of time under he that bridge. He probably felt in a way he, he did grow up there and live there. You know, it's probably a, a, a retreat for him, you know, especially someone with a chaotic home life or not even a stable home. So during this time of his life, he started to get involved in music a lot. He spent a lot of his time bumming around punk clubs. He kind of befriended uh, that band, the Melvins, and would hang out in their, uh, you know, fucking studio space a lot and their rehearsal space and started, you know, appearing here and there on albums. I didn't pull a list of all the stuff that he appeared on because there's several of them and it doesn't, you know, you can go look into this. We're not. We're not Wikipedia the show, <laughs> no matter what people might think. But he started to dip his toe into uh, music, started to make contacts, and started to build you know, the relationships that would become his musical career at this point in his life. And in uh, 1987, he met and began dating uh, a woman named Toby Vale, who was a punk critic and drummer for the band Bikini Kill. Um, Bikini Kill was like a very central band in the Riot Girl punk movement, which was like a feminist punk movement. Um, actually, Toby Vale is credited with coining the spelling of girl in Riot Girl. It's Riot G R R R L. Riot Girl. Girl. Um, so this was um, not his first relationship, but one of his first significant relationships. Um, they spent a lot of their time talking politics and philosophy, and this is really where I think Kurt started to dip his toe into that sort of realm. Um, a lot of it centered around feminism, obviously, her being a, a big pioneer in the riot girl movement, um, anarchism, uh, Buddhism, and Jainism. So she was fond of Eastern philosophies and uh, political, you know, uh, hot button issues. Sounds like the kind of person that would either get blocked on my Twitter or would block me yes. from their Twitter. Very likely, <laughs> Kurt would have blocked you as well. Yes. Um, a lot of a lot of people ask me a lot of the times because you know I I really enjoy Nirvana's one of the most foundational bands of my life. Kurt Cobain is one of the big figures of my childhood. A lot of people ask me how how, how do you come to peace with the fact that Kurt was basically an SJW, and I'm like I don't have to. Like I, I never, I never had to (laughs) like, that's you. It's you that has to come to peace with what somebody fucking (laughs) believes to enjoy their art. Not me. Yeah. Don't try and put that on me. I don't give a fuck what he believed. I think it's interesting. Well, that's like, you know, for example, Kevin Spacey, he did a lot of reprehensible shit, but it's like saying, I can't go back and watch American beauty and go, well, this is a good performance. This is a good movie. Yep. You know, it's like I don't have to reconcile those two things. It's just bullshit. It's a bullshit attitude to have and quit like quit asking people dumb shit like that. Um, I don't don't care. I don't care that Kurt Cobain had really left leaning views and really left leaning views on gender. I I don't care. He was from the most most from fucking Seattle. One of the most progressive parts of the United States. Of course, he's going to have these feelings. Look who he's dating. And I'm telling you, the feminist movement used to be pretty badass. If you listen to Bikini Kill, it's pretty badass punk music, man. So I'm telling you, like if feminists were doing more making punk music and shit counterculture and less whining counterculture. You'd, you'd probably have a little different view of them these days, but whatever. Those days are past, folks. Well, I mean, uh, those days are past for everybody. Like, everything's been pussified from this this point. I yep. mean, you know. I mean, Kurt couldn't be an SJW by today's standards. He might have been a precursor to the SJWs, but, I mean, today, I mean, we already seen, uh, you know, the song uh, Rape Me. You know, that was one of the, I mean, what was one of the art ones in that article I pulled up about, oh, you know, yeah. the songs that are bad now. 
Yeah, and, and, like, that's, uh, and that and that's a song about rape. I know. That's a like, song about. Uh, that's a song against. But not fucking, only not only against rape, but it's also a song about how he felt raped by the media at that point. So it was a song with a dual meaning, neither of which is mentioned in that shit fuck article you covered. I, I remember. Um, when I bought this album, like in utero, like years ago, uh, on the back it wasn't wasn't rape me, it was like waif me, some yeah. ge- some generic waif shit. me. But we'll get to his albums here. Just pretty as soon. powerful. We're fast approaching the time when Kurt Cobain but goes I, I from. I thought that was interesting. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Um, just as powerful. But yeah, he's he's <sighs> right now at this point in his life, he's kind of just a Seattle gutter snipe who's kind of hanging around punk clubs and yeah doing some guitar yeah and just you basically you know that, i mean really before too he was just working bullshit jobs like yep. it was all just in the in the idea of pursuing music and eventually like you said he just does that he yep. just he's, he just goes all in <clears throat> so he um he was involved in two bands at this time in his life at different eras uh one of them was called fecal matter cool um they released uh, one album in 1986 called illiteracy will prevail and it's actually pretty cool to listen to um, the next one is uh, he was involved in a band with this girl that we're talking about, Toby Vale, called Bathtub is Real. And it was just a four, ta- uh, four track demo re- that he recorded with his girlfriend at the time. Um, but it wasn't long after after that, uh, through a lot of the connections that he'd made, uh, that he met Chris Novoselic and he was hanging out with Chris a lot in the Melvin's uh, room and begging him, basically. Um, to join him and make a band with him. And Chris was really didn't want to do it. He just wasn't interested, didn't want to do it, was happy doing whatever he was doing. But uh, Kurt was finally able to convince him to join, and Nirvana was born. And it's assumed, um, in fact, I think Kurt talked about the name of the band Nirvana being born out of those conversations we talked about with Toby Vale about Buddhism and Jainism. Um so while hanging out uh, in the practice space of punk band The Melvins, yeah, 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 we got that. Let's see. Uh, re- religion uh, appeared to remain significant to Kurt during this time. He often used Christian imagery in his work and maintained constant interest in Jainism and Buddhist philosophy. The band name Nirvana was taken from the Buddhist concept. which He's a real main... student of religion in general. Oh, yeah, for sure. He was definitely a seeker. Um uh, C- Kurt Cobain described the Buddhist concept of uh, Nirvana as freedom from pain, suffering, and the external world, a Just, concept that he aligned with the punk uh, punk, punk rock ethos I mean, also ethos very, very and telling ideology. for the way his life yeah. ends up. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, like, just, like, the foreshadowing there, just it's, it's just crazy. So he finally gets Chris, and they basically, he and Chris start Nirvana, and they have this rotating roster of drummers. They get together, um, and if you want to pull up their, their discography now, I guess we could start, and then I'll, I'll turn it over, and we'll just start talking about them one by one. Um, but they, they record Bleach and start doing touring. And Kurt is immediately kind of disenchanted with the touring life. They're not making a whole lot of money. They're playing shitty places. Um, you know, they were having all these drummer problems. Um, the band eventually settled on Chad Channing, and they recorded the album Bleach. And uh, that was released in 1989. Originally called Too Many Humans, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Which I like better. As a uh, title. <laughs> sure, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Bleach can Bleach is fun, too, but... Available on Sub Pop Records. Um, Sub Pop. Right after... Soon after the, the recording of Bleach, uh, Kurt kind of got sick of the, their drummer's style, and they finally settled on Dave Grohl. So they found Dave Grohl after Bleach, and the final roster of Nirvana was uh, pretty much set from that point on. Um... And uh, in 91, they released their first major label uh, debut, which was Nevermind's, which was the big album that broke them. And I figure at this point, we can just kind of have a conversation about their albums. Yeah. Um, uh, some of the uh, most of the albums on this list here are B sides, re releases, uh, live uh, performances. Because they only had uh, Bleach, three Nevermind. studio albums, really. I mean, yeah, in, in Euro. And then hormoning a was also album. a demo that was released, I think, before uh, Kurt died, and Incesticide as well. But after that, um, well, Unplugged in New York as well, I guess. Uh, but after that, you're looking at, you know, from the Muddy Banks of the Wishka, which was the first album that was released uh, posthumously. So, starting with Bleach. I mean, do you guys have a favorite Nirvana album? Maybe we should start there. My favorite's In Utero. In Utero? What about you, Scotty? Uh, 
Well, that's tough, dude. Um, probably a toss up between just depending on my mood. Never mind in in utero. Yeah. Well, why why in utero for you, TJ? Um, you know, uh, I I. I like the um, production values on it. I mean, I know that uh, there was sort of an initial attempt to do it with a more raw sound, and Kurt listened to it is like, hell no, <laughs> fuck this. And then he did this way more polished version. Um, I don't know. I really like the high production values. I think that even though they came from the punk ethos, um, they really sounded well as like a really polished band. I think they could have done some really fucking epic shit. I mean, Nirvana sounded good um, no matter what. Yeah, they sounded good live. I, I agree with down, that. Unplugged. But I really produced. liked them at the. I really liked them at the height of the production values, and that's pretty much in utero. Yeah. Um, I like a lot of the songs on there. I just think that um, his wit was kind of maturing a little bit. Um, I I love the. The com- I mean, like he'd always dealt with complex themes in his songs, but in a very simple, direct way. Um, and I just felt like you know there was a more of an abundance of like literary references going on. You know, and Kurt claimed about In Utero that it was his least connected album in terms of like uh, fucking lyrics and stuff. But examining it, I don't think that's true at no, all. I don't, I um, in not. Utero to me has always been the album that was his fuck you. I hate fame. I hate the media. I hate the way that you guys are constantly harping on me. Um, uh, you know, it was his big kind of middle finger to what his life had become yeah. post Neverland. Oh, totally. Um, and you know, he, 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 claimed he wasn't as emotionally connected to the lyrics in it but i i don't know i think that's just more i think that maybe what, what he was Kurt talking wanted. about i think what he was maybe talking about there is just the fact that so much of it is told through like allegory and stuff right whereas you really didn't see that a whole lot in the previous two albums i mean there was allegorical what, what stuff you really see with this is there's a lot of fucking vitriol there's a lot of just like you know he, he's trying to exercise this kind of I, I think self-loathing in a way. I mean, obviously he hated he hated the people around him. You know, that were suddenly surrounding him now that he's famous. Right. But he kind of hated what I think what it made him to. One of the interesting songs uh, on there is Sentless, uh, "Sentless Apprentice," which is based uh, largely on the book uh, "Perfume" by yeah. Patrick Susskind. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's a great. I mean that's a great novel in itself. And I think that if uh, the main character in that book is named Grenwy. Which is he's basically an, an orphan who was born in a fish market, um, and just has never has a cent. He grows up his whole life. He's always an outsider. He's always someone that just doesn't fit in, and then just starts killing women to kind of capture the essence of cent. Well, yeah. no, but not only does he not have a cent himself, but he, he has, has a super yeah, strong a super sense, sense of smell. Yeah. Well, I don't want to get too much in the book, but yeah, but yeah. yeah. There's a lot of really cool stories about how Kurt wrote songs, and he did a lot of mythologizing about songs and re- revisions of what he wrote songs about and insertion of different lyrics into songs to tie people to them. Well, we were just talking before this about how Kurt painstakingly wrote the lyrics to Something in the Way, which can be found on Nevermind, yep. and then in front of his band and some and the studio engineers and stuff pretended to write it on the spot there <laughs> yes like he's oh yeah i just i feel the art flowing through me and really it's something that he'd written and revised and rewritten so many times but he just wanted it to seem to everyone around him like it was this big spontaneous moment of creation I mean, so very cognizant of his image oh, even yeah. to his for, own bandmates for a guy that kind of appeared lackadaisical and disheveled I mean he was a guy that was so completely dedicated to his music and oh, his yeah. persona and his image and his art that like he would try to obviously yeah give the impression oh I just kind of th- this just kind of came spontaneously but yeah I guarantee you everything that was on that album was something he had worked on in his head for countless hours. One of my favorite uh, mythological possibly stories about Smells Like Teen Spirit, which is our I mean, their, it's their biggest song. It's the song yeah. that broke them. Yes, um, was that uh, it was when he was hanging around with that girl we talked about, Toby. What, what the fuck to- was her name? Uh, Toby Vale. Toby Vale, yeah. And she wore teen spirit deodorant all the time. And Kurt was hanging around uh, somewhere, and uh, one of the girls that was chilling there wrote, Kurt smells like teen spirit on a bathroom mirror in deodorant. And Kurt saw it and didn't know the brand teen spirit was even a thing and inferred some deeper meaning from it and was inspired (laughs) to write smells like teen spirit. It wasn't until after he'd written it 
and started to perform it that he knew that it was a deodorant brand. <laughs> so that's a pretty interesting story. Great, great free advertising, though. Uh, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Inadvertently. I, I always thought that was kind of the irony of that song is that it's it was named after a fucking deodorant that was just like this... So, uh, like a product you would see shill just anywhere on TV, wherever, you know, just like. But, but, but you know, but Kurt thought that it meant something. Yeah, he deeper. thought it. But that was, that, that's you know? He took it literally, and he, he was like, he teen spirit. Yes, he took, what he is took, teen spirit? He took it a different way, which is cool. I mean, he really. Like a lot of artists, he took something and made it his own. And that's well, why. Well, uh, someone in the chat just said Kurt hated smells like teen spirit. By the no, end of it, yeah, he hated no, I mean, playing he, it for he, crowds he, and shit, he, of he, course. I mean, he hated it because it was like, to him, it represented him as this mainstream commodity kind of thing, which he rebelled against, even though on another level he wanted it. It's like just appearing on the cover of Rolling Stone with a shirt that says corporate magazine still suck doesn't <laughs> negate that you're still on the cover of fucking Rolling exactly. Stone. And right. like, Kurt I think it's a walking contradiction, like any artist. I does. mean, he was a bundle of contradictions. Like more than anyone else I can think of as an artist, he was a bundle of contradictions. Yep. That's really like the heart of Kurt yeah, Cobain. Fame, hated fame. Is that, you know, he's so, divided well, against well, himself. Know if he truly didn't want to be on the cover of Rolling Stone, he just wouldn't have done it. Right. But, um, but, but, but then he has sent a message. He wanted to do it, but he wanted to, to say that he still was smart enough well, to see well, through he had, it. He had, that, he had those punk roots, so part of him is like, fuck this, I don't need this, this is bullshit, this isn't why I'm a musician, but then the other part is like, well, I really do want everyone to know who I am, I do want to be famous, I do really crave this. Yep. So my favorite album on this list is Incesticide, and it's not even a proper album. It's like a collection of B-sides. It's a B-side collection. Um, but I love the lo-fi recording of it. I love the aggression in Kurt's voice. I mean, it's really a fucking chainsaw. On the, I, 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 I don't know. I just find myself coming back to it more than anything else, but I listen to the entire Nirvana discography constantly. Yeah. The two that I probably listen to the most, and I'm not like you. I'm not listening to the whole discography all the time. Um, I really find myself visiting in utero and unplugged in New York a lot. Yeah. Um, Which I is a find, beautiful album. I find myself going to Bleach every now and then. Don't really find myself going to Nevermind very much. Uh, that's probably the one I go to least, too, just because I listen to it back to front so many fucking times. And it's, you know, probably the most overplayed of their albums. Yeah. So. But uh, what's interesting on the Unplugged album too is uh, during the show he makes the claim that they want he, I think he wants to buy someone's guitar for five hundred thousand dollars, which actually he was offered to buy it, but it was more like fifty thousand dollars. Right. Uh, that's a really great album and performance. I, I really love on that one uh, the man who sold the world. Yep. That's a really good, I mean, but there's a lot of other great covers. It's really just a great show. Absolutely. If you, if you haven't seen it for some reason, definitely go on it YouTube put and watch Unplugged. It. MTV Unplugged on the map. Oh, yeah. It's the only I mean, one that, I mean, I think people really was, remember yeah. over the test of time. And you know? I mean, it was an immediate worldwide success and released as an album, which was an immediate I mean, let me see how many success. times... Uh, let's say... I'm going to go ahead and, uh, while you guys are talking, look up some sales figures on this stuff. Sure. Um, I mean, it's just staggering. I mean, Nirvana... Like, I'll tell you. Like, how did you guys... Do, did you get into Nirvana back in the 90s or were you... Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, pretty. I mean, honestly, pretty early on. I mean, I was. I've never been like one of like uh, a huge, huge Nirvana fan, but I've always been a fan. Right. Um, I, I liked them, them when, was, when like, they arrived on the scene. Yeah. In '92, I would have been 12, and that's when Nevermind was released. I think, or was it '93? I would have been 12 or 13 at any rate, and. Um, it like completely changed the the trajectory of my musical taste when I heard it because I, at that time, my parents had divorced and I had moved across town and I was in a different part of the district where most of the kids I was hanging out with were Mexican kids who listened to rap. And so from sixth through the eighth grade, that's pretty much all I listened to was rap music. I was completely out of the rock shit. I yeah, uh, in the more. United States alone, MTV Unplugged in New York sold 5.1 million albums. Platinum in the U.S., five times platinum in the U.S., five times platinum in Australia. It's insane. Platinum. It's platinum everywhere. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, obviously albums really don't go gold or platinum anymore too often because... The this you know no one buys physical media like they used to. I mean, it's a testament to how tight the band was too. That yes. a live album, like a live performance of theirs, did sold more albums than most fucking produced studio albums. Sell. Yeah, way more. Um, 
But anyways, I, as I was saying, I was into rap and shit, and then a friend of mine brought this CD over, and really the only song I listened to on, on it that night was Smells Like Teen Spirit, because it was the big one that was on MTV at the time. And it just changed my life. That whole I got that album immediately as soon as I could fucking save up my chore money for it, and I never looked back, but... Um, you know, I wasn't into them as as much as my friends were at first. All right, someone in the chat is letting me know that another very popular unplugged that I guess has sold 22 million albums is Eric Clapton Unplugged. Would you so, know my name? All right, I'm, that's fine. Eric Clapton, good congratulations to Eric Clapton. Thanks. Sorry. I mean, it might have. Sold I'm sorry. In my time. world, there's more of a hubbub about. Nirvana there unplugged than Eric might have Clapton sold really unplugged. Well, but I'll tell you what, I'd be willing to bet you a lot of money if you looked on uh, YouTube right now and typed in unplugged, MTV unplugged, this is going to come up first. Let's see. I'm not uh, denying that Eric Clapton didn't sell really well and a lot of people didn't really love it. But this is, I think, really stood the test of time a lot more than oh, for sure. Eric Clapton's unplugged performance. Bah. Let's see. I, I just typed in unplugged. Actually, the first one that comes up is Alice in Chains Unplugged. That's, that is strange, but hey, another Seattle band. But uh, actually, the Nirvana Unplugged has more views than that, So, there and it's go. next on the list. Eric Clapton, you don't get until, like, here's all the ones that are before Eric Clapton. Alice in Chains, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, Kiss, and then Eric Clapton. Who has yeah. the most in, in terms of views? Uh, Nirvana. Wait. Okay. It has well, to be. Uh, wait, no. No. Um, well, for I don't. I mean, I, I'd have to go look at every individual song to see that. Sure. But right. uh, there's an Aha Take on Me unplugged that has 6.4 million views, and that's pretty. That's pretty high. Um, but yeah, I don't know. As far as the full shows go, it looks like Nirvana's has got the the highest rated one so uh, think, or the highest viewed one. I think at this point, that I can see we might be ready to introduce the villain of the story this point Hold on. before you introduce the villain let oh, me yeah. just do something we probably should have sure. done at the top of the show sure and talk about hey we know you guys watching this are patrons we have a new patron level here it's called the chef's table for ten dollars oh shit so uh i'm, I'm not gonna d- do this because i don't want to interrupt the flow of the show but you can go here you can go to our patreon and read this you must have- it's a nice long description of exactly what you'll get let's just say we did everything in our power to make it worth it to you yep so uh if you're already a five dollar patron and you want to become a ten dollar patron you know, uh, take a look at that. See if you feel like it's worth it. We tried our best to make it worth it to you. So check that out. Sorry, Paul. Don't want to interrupt your, no, your no, flow. No, that's fine. Yeah, but, you're right. Uh, we should have covered that. Good to let people know and shit. Well, the reason we didn't is because there was so much fucking wrong with the audio when we started. Oh, but yeah. well, the villain, you want to set up the villain of the yes, story? Yes, stage right. Courtney Love. You liking it? I think it's a pretty good goddamn episode. Yeah, a lot of people like this one. Was Kurt Cobain murdered? That's a big question, you know? You think you know? I don't know. You might want to watch to the end. Who freaking knows, man? Spookily wookily. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think in the comments section down below. I'll try to remember to read it. I think I'll, I think I'll remember to read it. Um, anyway, I'm just here once again to tell you to join that Patreon. You know where it is. It's down there. I don't really know what else, uh, what other sales pitch I can do. I mean, you guys are watching this. You're obviously enjoying it. Come on. <laughs> Just friggin' join. Like, just do it. Come on, please. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Um, so, Love and Cobain met on January 12th, 1990, in Portland's uh, Satyricon nightclub, where they both still led ardent underground rock bands. So, she was in a rock band. He was in a rock band. They played a gig at this uh, nightclub together and met. Uh, Love immediately made advances on him and, in fact, had a pretty sordid history of being a groupie, um, kind of made the rounds of the Seattle music scene looking for a boyfriend. Yeah. Um, But she immediately made advances on Kurt, but Kurt was evasive. Uh, Early in their interactions, Cobain broke off dates and ignored Love's advances because he was unsure if he wanted a relationship. Cobain noted, I was determined to be a bachelor for a few months. But I knew that I liked Courtney so much right away that it was a really hard struggle to stay away from her for so many months. So he clearly liked her, too. But coming off the uh, sour end of 
two or three failed relationships. It was kind of like, ah, eh, maybe not. But eventually, um, he relented. Um, I mean, let's be real here, too. I mean, Kurt was... I mean, I'm not saying he didn't have his aggressive streak, but you can tell that he was more of a passive-aggressive person. Courtney Love is not passive-aggressive. She's just aggressive. So, I mean, I think that in a lot of ways, she probably domineered and bullied him into having this relationship. But, uh, maybe, maybe, Grohl, maybe he wanted that, too. You know? Dave Grohl uh, apparently played a pretty big role in setting them up, though. Well, you could see him, that's him in between yeah, them right there. Kurt uh, talked to Dave about C- Courtney, and Kurt, uh, you know, uh, Dave was like, you know, here's what she's into. Here's the type of sh- stuff she likes. And a lot of it was stuff that he was into. And so he decided to go ahead and relent and go on a date with her. And uh, they dated um, pretty exclusively for uh, about a year. Um, they uh, in late '91 they were often together and were bonded through drug use. So it was at this point in Kurt's career that heroin uh, really started to enter his life. Whether or not he was, I, I doubt he was introduced to it by uh, by Courtney, but it became a problem. Which one was worse for him? <laughs> I don't uh, know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, a, a that's, a, that's a question. Um, I pose so that to the audience. In 92, a few days after the conclusion of Nirvana's Pacific Rim tour, Cobain and Love were married in Waikiki. This is a picture from that marriage. Uh, Love wore a satin and lace dress once owned by Frances Farmer, who's a feminist icon from Seattle. And uh, Cobain donned a Guatemalan purse and wore green pajamas because, quote, he had been too lazy to put on a tux. Eight people were in attendance at the ceremony, including, obviously, Dave Grohl. Dude, I wonder if this was all part of Dave Grohl's plan to eventually... <laughs> to take Nirvana? Yeah, you know. Look into the sky to save me. Yep, maybe he wanted it. Maybe he's like, you know what? I want my own success as a band. I can handle it. How do I kill this guy and have no one blame me? I know. Uh, I'll set him up with these... with human rat poison in the form of Courtney Love. Yeah, man, because they were already on top of the fucking world, dude. I mean, if anything, as a brief diversion, Dave Grohl, is, that, that was astonishing. He's had a lot of staying power. I mean, whether you like his music or not, he's been very successful even after Nirvana, which is honestly pretty rare. Chris Novoselic is just Chris as Novoselic. successful, dude. Uh, no, he's, he's just a fat, <laughs> middle-aged man now, kind of just chilling. Yeah. Um, in an interview with The Guardian, Love revealed the opposition to their marriage, marriage from various people. Uh, Kim Gordon of Sonic Youth sits me down. This is a quote uh, from her and says, if you marry him, your life is not going to go anywhere. Your life is not going to happen. It will destroy your life. But I said, whatever. I love him and I want to be with him. It wasn't his fault. He wasn't trying to do that to me. Uh, Sonic Youth is, in my opinion, one of the worst fucking bands, period. So <laughs> I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah, we saw them live at Voodoo Fest, maybe me and TJ, like maybe 14 years ago or something. Kurt, however, was a big Terrible. fan. Nah, no accounting for taste. No account for taste, right? Yeah. Um, Love was already pregnant with their daughter when they got married. And uh, Frances Bean Cobain, I think I neglected to pull a picture of her, but maybe TJ can find one. I got one. I'm on it. Um, was born uh, August 8th, 1992. Uh, a sonogram of the couple's ad- as-yet-born baby was included in the artwork for Nirvana's single, Lithium. So they used her, uh, Frances... Bean uh, Cobain's, and obviously her first name was after Frances Farmer, the once again feminist icon. Um, so that's uh, Kurt, Courtney, and Frances Bean. There, it's like a happy little kid at this point in her life. You know, you can tell even with toddlers like this if they got a lot of turmoil at home. She looks like a pretty bright-eyed little kid, you know. Yeah, I heard she has a similar feeling about her dad that Kurt had about his. Which uh, is, yeah, she wants nothing to do with him. <laughs> isn't that isn't that the? Way I mean, it goes, she though? doesn't have to because he's dead. But yeah, oh like, yeah, that, that's true. She, she doesn't a lot of shit about Kurt. Yeah, she basically is like, I don't see what the big deal is about him. He's a piece of shit. Fuck him, basically. So. uh... Kurt Cobain's first experience with heroin occurred uh, earlier, sometime in 1986. This is her today, by the way, if I can get her to uh, Francis Bean, pop yeah. up. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about Francis Bean later. She's we've we get, there's a an actual uh, late breaking news story related in the uh, Kurt Cobain universe. So we'll talk about that interesting later. how that works sometimes yeah. with uh, with this I, show. I went looking for shit about Kurt today to finish up research on this and found a news story about him. So pretty cool. Um, 
Let's see. Uh, so, yeah, he started doing uh, heroin for the first time in 1986. It was administered to him by a local drug dealer in Tacoma, Washington, who was previously dealing him uh, oxycodone. Uh, Should have stuck with the oxys. Yep. He used heroin sporadically for several years, but by the end of 1990, his use had developed into a full-fledged addiction. Uh, Cobain claimed that he was determined to get a habit as a way to self-medicate his stomach condition. Now, once again, we're talking about was is this true was kurt mythologizing himself and just or was he just making an excuse yeah, you're for right that making ex- like, like many giving, bands, when we look at the past we just we just don't know right we don't know but you gotta you know it's a big question mark and unfortunately one that'll probably never be answered um almost certainly never will be answered unless paul build a time machine uh, he, 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 he quoted uh, himself on heroin here. Uh, this is, oh, he didn't quote himself. I'm quoting him. I'm going to quote myself. Uh, yeah. He said, it started with three days in a row of doing heroin, and I don't have a stomach pain. That was such a relief. Uh, however, his longtime friend Buzz Osborne disputes this, saying that his stomach pain was more likely caused by his heroin use. Saying uh, he made it up for sympathy and so that he could use it as an excuse to stay yeah. loaded. Heroin makes you, a lot of opiates make you constipated. And vomit. Yeah. He said, of course he was vomiting. That's what people on heroin do. They vomit. It's called vomiting with a smile on your face. So that's his friend, yeah. Buzz. Yeah. So who knows if that's just him trying to snipe out I him mean, after his death or if there's any truth to that. I mean, another thing that heroin does, you get these nods. And it's a great painkiller. Most people that, that I've known that have done heroin just say, like, you know, why, if you've asked them, well, why do you do heroin? They always like, oh, well, you, just, you just feel great. Any of the pain you have in your life, you just don't give a shit about it or you just don't feel it or don't care. So in a 1992 article in Vanity Fair, Courtney Love admitted to using heroin, not knowing that she was pregnant. However, Love claimed that Vanity Fair had misquoted her, but the event created a giant media firestorm for the couple. Uh, While Cobain and Love's romance had always been a media attraction, they found themselves hounded by tabloids and uh, articles and articles and articles on top of articles, just speculating all kinds of crazy shit they about just their became private tabloid lives. Yep. At that point, it was like you, you go to the grocery um, store and you see shit, and it's all like they were. Oh, sorry, go ahead. You know, Courtney Love on heroin. Kirk, I mean, yeah. at this point, this is Kurt at the height of his fame. I mean, and of course, whoever he's fucking is also going to be. And, and a lot of people have accused Courtney Love of the, a big thing as being a fame hound, but you know, because I mean, Kurt wasn't quite huge when they met, but he also wasn't nobody. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they were at one point apparently ba- barraged with me- media requests, all of them wanting to talk about whether or not Frances Bean had been born addicted to heroin, which, take a look at this little child, she was fine. Um, Love claimed later that uh, she ceased doing heroin upon learning that she was pregnant. So it sounds like she probably maybe did heroin a couple of times before she knew she was pregnant, but she was not. I, 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 I don't, I don't know, dude. I don't see a heroin baby when I look at little Francis Bean here. No, I don't know. She seems pretty happy, you know? <laughs> yeah. Maybe she's high as fuck. She's Who knows? fucking tripping, dude. She's rolling. Um, so that kind of covers, um, up to the, you know, the suicide. And I, and I, I labeled this, this section of my notes, suicide, suicide? question mark. Um, so, following a tour stop at uh, Terminal Eins in Munich, Germany, on March 1st, 1994, Cobain was diagnosed with bronchitis and severe laryngitis, both things that he suffered with his whole life, um, even as a kid. He flew to Rome the next day for medical treatment, and he was joined there by Courtney Love on March 3rd. And I'm sorry I have to read all this, but it's important to get a timeline because there's a lot of disputes and a lot of weirdness surrounding this. So, on March 3rd, 94. The next morning, Love awoke to find Kurt Cobain had overdosed on a combination of champagne and rohypnol, or rohypnol, sorry, uh, which is a um, uh, not a barbiturate, a fucking what's a, what, what kind of drug is Xanax? Uh, anti-anxiety, you mean? Or? Yeah, it's but the, you know, whatever, whatever those are called. Um, oh, I, I, I get yeah, they're, they had, they're not barbiturates or something else. Like SSRIs or yeah, it's not that, but uh, it's benzodiazepines. Benzo yeah, there you yeah, go. It's it's a a benzo. Yeah, it's a benzo. Yeah. So Cobain was immediately rushed to the hospital. He was found unresponsive. He spent the rest of the day unconscious. And after five days in the hospital, he was released and he returned home. Uh, Love later, now this is important, Love later stated that this incident was Cobain's first suicide attempt. Now, the only proof that we have of that is Courtney Love saying that, oh yeah, after he was dead, oh yeah, by the way, Kurt attempted suicide in Rome one time. It's uh, altogether possible that Kurt might have just been doing 
rohypnol fucking recreationally and drinking champagne in his hotel room and did too much. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the only insinuation that that was a suicide attempt comes from Courtney Love. Um, so Love, um, worried about him after this, arranged uh, an intervention regarding... Um, so she arranged an intervention for uh, Kurt involving uh, studio executives and friends of his from so this, that at business. At this point, this is uh, March 25th, 1994. Yep, March 25th, yeah. Um, she has all these studio guys, bandmates, friends of their family. Um, there were 10 people in all uh, at this thing. Um, the intervention was initially unsuccessful. Kurt was apparently, and once again, this is a recounting of what happened. He was uh, pissed. He was pissed. He was angry. He, he locked himself in his room and refused to fucking come out. Um, but by the end of the day, they had managed to wear him down, and he agreed to undergo detox. Um, so he went to the Exodus Recovery Center in Los Angeles on March 30th, 1994. And uh, the staff at the uh, facility were unaware of Cobain's history of depression and prior attempt at suicide. So when they, they admitted him to this... Uh, Courtney Love, who later after his death said, oh, yeah, he tried to commit suicide, neglected to tell that to them. Yeah. Might, <laughs> might have been important. Might have been an important thing to tell people that are trying to treat somebody who's a habitual drug abuser, but whatever. Um, there's other been, there's other explanations for why she wouldn't mention that, though. Uh, sure. Sure. I mean, you got legal, legal concerns and stuff. Right. You got to fucking factor that in as well. I mean, like, I, I just think it's interesting <laughs> that it didn't. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I think it, it goes on and on. Now, it, here's here's more stuff. Yeah. When visited by friends, there was no indication, according to them, that Cobain was in any negative or suicidal state of mind. He spent the day talking to counselors about his drug abuse and personal problems. He uh, played with his daughter, Francis. And in fact, these interactions inside of the facility were the last time he saw his daughter. Um, the following night, Kurt Cobain walked outside to have a smoke, and he climbed over a six-foot-high fence to leave the facility. Uh, earlier on that day, he had joked to an orderly about how, what a stupid idea it would be to try to do such a thing. And uh, later that night, he did it. Um, he took a taxi to, LA, uh, to LAX and flew right back to Seattle. Uh, most of his close friends and family were unaware of where he was. On April 2nd and 3rd, he was seen uh, by various people in different spots around Seattle, old haunts of his, but he still um, remained a missing person to his daughter, his wife. Um, on April 3rd, uh, Courtney Love contracted a private investigator named Tom Grant and hired him uh, in order to try and track down Kurt. Uh, Kurt was not seen the next day. Uh, on April 8th, Kurt Cobain's body was discovered at the Lake Washington Boulevard home by an electrician who had arrived to install a security system. Apart from a minor amount of blood coming out of Cobain's ear, the electrician reported seeing no visible signs of trauma and initially believed that Cobain was asleep until he saw the shotgun pointing at his chin. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how that happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know how you put a shotgun... To your chin, blow your brains out, and just look asleep. Yeah, like he's just was his fucking skull made of adamantium? What the fuck? <clears throat> um, a note was found addressed to Cobain's childhood imaginary friend Bada. Um, I think I've, we've got that note. Yeah. Uh, here, here's the uh, actual handwritten note, and I have a transcription of it. I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and uh, enlarge it yeah, a little bit. I'll, as I'll, you I'll read. read some of it uh, uh, a little later. Um, oh, you're not yet. Yeah. Okay. But you can just we can look at it for sure. Um, oh, I guess I'll read part of it. He part of it uh, says that he uh, had not felt the excitement of listening to as well as creating music, along with really writing for too many years now. Um, Cobain's body had been lying there for days. The coroner's report estimated that Cobain had died on April 5th, 1994. So a full three days um, prior to being found by the electrician. A public vigil was held for Cobain on April 10th, 1994 at a public park uh, at Seattle Center, drawing approximately 7,000 mourners. Uh, Pre-recorded messages by Novoselic and Love were played at the memorial. Love read portions of Cobain's suicide note to the crowd, crying and chastising him as she did so. Um, and that's, you know, one of those clips that I would have loved to pull, but, you know, it's just insanely monetized by every news organization that did it. 
Um, near the end of the vigil, she uh, went to the park to hang out with people and gave out some of his clothing to the people that were there. Um, so we're getting now into the controversy, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, but we'll talk a little bit about the... Kurt Cobain was murdered! The controversies and the conspiracy theories surrounding Kurt Cobain's death. Um, one of the most notable ones is the suicide note itself. And if you scroll down, TJ, mm -hmm. you'll see that the last few lines of the note are written in what appears to be a very different hand than what's above yeah, the line. Yeah, uh, I mean, when I scrolled down, it immediately struck me as like, hmm, this doesn't really look like the same handwriting. Hmm. Now, you remember that investigator, Tom Grant, that Courtney Love hired to... Hired to uh, find right Kurt. yeah well he ended up investigating and finding some worrying things and uh, ended up kind of dedicating his life to investigating Courtney Love and the death of Kurt Cobain because what he found was a lot of inconsistencies uh, Tom Grant claims um, that he has a handwriting sample that was uh, given to um, uh, this lawyer uh, Kurt Cobain's lawyer by Courtney Love that uh, he he claims looks exactly like this. Now, I couldn't find any of it. So you got to take everything Tom Grant says with a grain of salt here. He might be just some dude that was yeah. involved in the case. I mean, this could side. be like, I mean, oh, yeah, I'm an, I was involved in a famous case. How can I keep this right, going? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, consider the fucking source. I mean, he's, yeah, he's hired to find. Did Kirk you find Cobain. that, by the way, TJ? Find what? The, the whatnot and what have you. The legal tobacco? Yeah. Okay, cool. I did. Well, I mean, yeah, you, you, that, that, there's kind of a preponderance, too, there. You know, you, you have to really consider his motive as well. I mean, he's hired to find Kirk Cobain. He ends up dead. And right. it becomes like a national phenomenon, like a national news. I mean, of course. An international news story that people still talk about and argue about to this day. And that remains the people's biggest criticism of Tom Grant, that he's just enriching or, or attempting to enrich himself and get his name out there. However, Tom Grant is no longer doing this. <laughs> Um, after the release of the movie a few years ago, Soaked in Bleach, um, which kind of outlines his major problems with the case and what he discovered and his side of the story, he claims that there's really nothing else he can add and he can't afford to continue going forward. So he didn't really enrich himself all that much from this in the end. Um, but he might have just been, you know. I mean, that, you know, we but don't, one of the things. How much money did that, sure. did that, did that documentary make, though? We right. don't know that. I mean, maybe he spent more. I, I don't really know, but I mean, maybe he did just, just a different. Well, he didn't. I don't know. I don't know that he had a full cut of that. Oh, true. He was just. Oh, a, also, he was just the subject. I mean, it's not like. He, I mean, even people talk about this unless you've really looked into it. You don't really know his name. So one of the things that Tom Grant alleges that, that is that in a roundabout way, these last few lines uh, were yeah. added after, and that this was never meant to be a suicide note, but just a letter of frustration. Kurt was often known to write in his journals and diaries and, and pretty much everywhere he went, his feelings and thoughts. He was pretty prolific about it. He was always writing lyrics, always writing letters. Um, and the difference in his hand between the top and the bottom has raised a lot of eyebrows, including Tom Grant's, who alleges that it was Courtney Love herself that was attempting to write like Kurt, but did it bigger so that the changes would be more noticeable down below, etc. Uh, the truth of that, big question mark. Who the fuck knows? Um, so, <clears throat> it's kind of suspicious that the only part that directly references him killing himself is written in yes. what appears to be or a different the handwriting. Only part that mentions Courtney or Francis. Remember, this is a letter that is uh, well, I mean, titled I think to his childhood friend, Bada. Uh, I mean, like, it, the part that says... His childhood imaginary friend, the part, sorry. Yeah. The part that says Francis and Courtney, I'll be at your altar, looks like it might be his hand, but everything else after that looks fake. So it is, it, well, it's one of the things that that conspiracy theorists have raised their eyebrows out of so here. So that, that part of the letter is disputed. Yes. I mean, I'm sure that plenty of people have done handwriting analysis <laughs> I mean, not on by this. the estate, of course. Well, no. Courtney controls that, but disputed by conspiracy theorists, for sure. So here's, here's a list of some of the other things that Tom Grant says are problematic. The bloodstream heroin levels. You guys have probably heard this. Yeah, I've heard this around. one. Yeah. Um, he had an incredible amount. Let's see. I know I wrote it down here. Um, the level of heroin in Cobain's bloodstream was 1.52 milligrams per liter. And that there was also evidence of Valium in his blood. So that's double opiate. Uh, or uh, that's, a, that's a benzo and an opiate, which is pretty deadly to mix. Uh, the report also contained a quote from Dr. Randall uh, Baselt 
of the Chemical Toxicological Institute, stating that Cobain's heroin level was at a high concentration by any account. He also stated that the strength of the dose would depend on many factors, including how habituated Cobain had to the drug, which after hearing about it, um, very, we, we know he was yeah. a very habituated I mean, user. He, he had, definitely had a very high tolerance. Uh, but Grant says that that amount of uh, heroin, even for a habituated user, would be way too much and that there's absolutely no way that Cobain could have injected himself with such a dose and still have been able to pull the trigger of the shotgun on his own. Big question mark about that. Once again, we don't know how much fucking tar heroin... Uh, he was shooting. We don't know how habituated he had become. We don't know how, uh, what his tolerance was. I mean, there's also been documented cases of people who, you know, should have died from other drugs that have survived. Right. I mean, some people have higher tolerance naturally. I mean, like there's people who are, you know, they drink one drink and they're fucking wasted and they can't even operate. And there's people who can drink to excess and be fine. It is possible that, you know, he was fucked up. But... if at that point, like, here's the thing with any of these: if you don't buy any of these explanations, then you then you pretty much almost have to assume he was murdered. Right. Uh, Grant, the investigator, doesn't believe that Cobain was killed by the heroin dose. His theory is, is that it was used to incapacitate him, and then the final gunshot blow is what killed him, and that was administered by whoever his murderer was. Um. So another problem he has is the door. The door into the place where Kurt Cobain uh, was found dead. Would that be this door we see here on the... It would be. Okay. Um, Now, that door was um, locked from the inside, and that was according to the police. And that was used as one of the things to debunk any conspiracy theories. However, when Tom Grant was there and doing his investigation, he found that the door could easily be locked and then pulled shut. So... Um, somebody could have killed Kurt and locked the door and then closed it and made it look like he locked himself in. Uh, that's, once again, according to Tom Grant's investigation. But another problem Tom Grant has with where Kurt Cobain was found was that a couple of nights before his body was found, Tom Grant was admitted to Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's home by a longtime family friend who was supposed to show him around the house to see if Kurt had left any evidence of having been there recently. And it was on that night that um, they, they, they tossed his whole bedroom, okay? And this longtime family yeah. friend who actually lived with them for a very long time neglected to take Tom Grant, according to Tom Grant's story now, neglected to take Tom Grant to the room over the garage where Kurt was found dead, which was Kurt's favorite place in the house to go and chill. Which is odd. And they'd flipped all of the bedrooms, and there was no evidence of the suicide note that was found the next day neatly on the bed uh, of Kurt and Courtney. But you could also argue, too, that maybe at that time he wasn't even there. So it was Well, the, the problem is is that he was supposedly dead for two days before this. Oh, okay, so, uh, no, so at the point... His time arrived, of death was <coughs> April 5th, oh, and he so, was in the house so, on the 6th. Okay, so this is, oh, so this is the 6th. Okay, Kurt I, was I, already I, dead when Tom Grant was at the house. And but the guy was who was oh, showing him the house just didn't, the guy that showed didn't him show him the, the room. He was a couple days before. Okay, I, I get you. So. Right. So he was actually dead, and they, and they, and they for some According reason, to the coroner's report, they don't know exactly when Kurt well, sure, died, they, they have, but they knew his body... He, they were estimated on the 5th. Tom Grant was in the house. I don't have it here, but it was either on the 6th or 7th. And just not... And and for some reason... Well, that's like, you know, we all know, like, TJ likes to go out back and smoke. And it's like, we don't go look for TJ out back for some reason. Right. So he alleges, of course, that that note was planted the next day and that the electrician was probably paid to do that alarm install so that he would find Kurt and it would all look neat. Yeah, so a, a, third, a third party that has nothing to do with it finds the body. Right. Um... So uh, another problem that that Grant has is the shotgun. Um, He has multiple problems um, with the shotgun. Um, First of which, it wasn't even taken. Fingerprints were not taken on the weapon until two days after Kurt's body were found. And when they were taken, only four latent prints were found that were unusable and unable to be identified to anybody. Um, The same thing is true for the suicide note and the pin that was stabbed through it into the bed that was found with it. Kurt's prints, nowhere to be found on the note. In fact, nobody's prints, anywhere to be found on the note. But Kurt was found... Yeah, that's pretty... Un- see- I mean, I watch a lot of forensic files yeah. and shit. It's actually really unusual yeah. for especially a suicide note to not have fingerprints because it's you're perspiring heavily when you're about right. to kill yourself. And you can see yeah. here, Kurt was found not wearing gloves, 
so the glove idea is right out. You know, if you, well, I mean, you know, also he's not tr- he's not trying to cover up his right, own suicide. Right, right. Yeah, you know, so doesn't that doesn't make any sense. Um, there's also some stuff that <laughs> you'll have to watch Soaked in Bleach to get a better understanding of. I won't give a. I'll give you the nuts and bolts of it. Um, Tom Grant feels like that the placement of the shotgun as it was found is just completely wrong in terms of what is alleged to have happened that the shotgun would have flown out of his hand in a different way and ended up at a different part of his body um there's all kinds of stuff that he alleges about the shotgun that you can go look into i just wanted to kind of touch on it it, it is just, interesting how with this case and i mean needless to say the position of the shotgun is not where you would expect it to be well, well that well, not where tom grant would well, expect it to be it's interesting to think because one of the things that i think we can all agree upon i mean whether they killed himself or not that's something we'll never truly know there, there is a some evidence suggests that, you know, it is possible he was murdered. But at the same time, <coughs> you know, you look at everything and you have to kind of wonder. All right. I, I, I want I, everyone to just uh, uh, everyone uh, uh, just assign a percentage of this. Scotty, you're already talking. So what do you think is the, like, percentage killed himself, percentage murdered? I think with how terrible the investigation was and it's i mean like, like i said that like to me that's that's beyond dispute the seattle police department did not do a very good job like paul said there's a lot of flaws but you can find that in a lot of cases too i mean like shows like forensic files show but you this that. is this is such a high profile case to not but, be but i mean think about that too investigated sound properly better if he was murdered or sound better if he kills himself I mean, it, it, because, I think because, it matters. I, I, well, no, I'm saying, but I, I think from the, a PR perspective, it wraps it up very nicely. He was a very troubled guy. Sure. And he took his own life. And people go, oh, that's really sad. Right. But but to say, oh, he's murdered doesn't really sound as good. It sounds like, what the fuck? This famous rock star was murdered in, in his own fucking home. Right. For, and for what reason? For, for whose gain? And I mean, immediately, obviously, then your mind goes to Courtney Love because who had the most gain from Kurt's death? Of course. Now, I mean, a lot of people do argue, too, that, you know, she was devastated and there was a lot of genuine... But <clears throat> the I mean, chat is coming up with some stuff. But she could have genuinely actually been involved in it and felt really bad about it, too. What do they got to say about this? 98% killed himself, 70% murdered, 40% killed himself, 60% murdered. So, it's a divisive issue. 100% and, killed himself. And I'll tell you, in my mind... Uh, 80% like fit, he was fit. murdered... I mean, that's the, Cause that's cause the I, cause pragmatic, rational fucking p- point to take, right? 90% he killed himself. <laughs> I don't know, man. Honestly, there's so many discrepancies that don't make a whole lot of sense there that I think that it's I think it's a rational position to at least suspect that he was possibly killed. It's not illogical, I mean, illogical to consider the possibility. There's a couple more things to go over here. One of them we already kind of covered, the Rome story. Um, how conveniently after Kurt's death, then Courtney starts oh, by talking the way, he about, oh, yeah, he tried to kill himself. Um, uh, you know, and he that's ele- really suspicious, too. Yeah. Because think about that. Like, if you tried to kill yourself, and then I never, we never mentioned, it, oh, Paul tried to kill himself. You know what I mean? Like, no right. one just... Well, I mean, you know, you could do that out of respect for Paul's privacy but, or some other but, thing. you know, but, I don't but, know. He, but not, but, uh, yeah, maybe do a public, in a public sense, but, like, me and you would talk, like, man, Paul tried to kill himself. That was crazy. Right. Yeah. So, in his theory... At least theory, his close friends would know His theory it. is pretty obvious, and I think plausible that she uh, planted that story afterward to make his suicide story look more concrete uh it certainly looks more concrete if just uh, i'm gonna go ahead and create earlier he tried to kill himself i'm gonna go ahead and create a uh poll on our um our uh patreon Patreon? cool yeah i'm gonna go ahead because i think this is a poll worthy issue um i'm gonna go ahead and uh do that right now yeah uh, we'll check it maybe at the end of the show We're, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here yeah, uh, what do you what do you assign to the probabilities, Paul? I mean, I'm pro- my biases tend towards that he that there was some foul play involved. Um, probably seventy thirty. I, I'm pretty sure that the the story's just dirty. It just sounds dirty to me, and I'm not even covering all of it. There's one last thing that I wanted to cover here, and then we'll move on from uh, Tom Grant's uh, theories and and right. information. Uh, one of them, the the lawyer. Uh, Kurt's personal lawyer. Uh, Grant spoke to Cobain's attorney, Rosemary Carroll, at her office on April 13th, 1994. He said she pressed him to investigate Cobain's death and that Cobain was not suicidal. Carroll also claims that Cobain had asked her to draw up a will excluding Courtney Love because he was planning to file for divorce. Grant says that this was the motive for Cobain's death. Carol was also provided Grant with a handwriting practice note that she found in Love's backpack that was left at her home. 
It had been suggested that the handwriting on this practice note is markedly similar to the handwriting found on the last four lines. So there's of a Cobain's note of note. Co- there's a note of Courtney trying yes. to emulate Kurt Cobain's signature. Yes, or or no, there's a note. Or no, his uh, handwriting. Was, there was a note from Courtney that was given to the lawyer at some point. In which the handwriting looks, and you can look it up. I couldn't find it last. I added this last one last minute, and I couldn't find that fucking note. Um, but yeah, um, they people say that the handwriting sample looks like the last few lines of Kurt's note. I think, you but know, did, you didn't hear that first part, Scotty. Did you? Well, did you hear the, about how the lawyer said that? Uh, Prior, prior to Cobain's death, that Cobain had uh, engaged her to start drawing up a will excluding Courtney Love because he planned on divorcing her. That is interesting. Which, of now, course, d- d- Tom Grant attributes to motive, which sure. I think is, if it's true... I think, you know, I, I think, though, too, to be fair to both sides, one is that Kurt Cobain did have kind of a, a, a almost fetishized suicide... To a large degree, he had he had a family history of mental illness. He had two, like I said, two uncles or two family members killed themselves. Yep. So, and I mean, to be honest with you, that is I have known actually personally people that have had family like family members where it's like there's a pattern in their family where the people just oh you have a disease and they blow their brains out. Yeah, and it, it, it is commonly run, it does run in families that suicide is more prevalent if someone in your family has you know killed themselves. Yeah. Or killed themselves. Oh, it's either. absolutely true. So yeah. I mean, there is there. So it's not like it's just totally. Here's an article about out this. of his character that he killed himself. You know what I mean? So obviously, there's <laughs> definitely discrepancies, and no matter how you look at it, it's not an open and shut. Well, here, here's this this story. Here was Kurt Cobain murdered. Experts say '90s grunge singer suicide note could have been doctored after finding handwriting practice sheet in Courtney Love's well, handbag. Uh, well, here's another theory though. Let's let's say this. Let's say Courtney, you know, Courtney Love did write that. Maybe she found. Maybe he killed himself, and she wrote it afterwards to make it seem to make herself feel better, to make it look like, oh, he he thought of us. And I mean, end. you don't doctor somebody's fucking suicide note she, without malicious <laughs> intent. She might have. I don't know. I, I mean, mean, maybe it's possible. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times people do, like, if they find a relative who's killed themselves accidentally by like masturbating. You know, doing those like trying to right. deprivate themselves, they'll try to present the death in a different light. So maybe she did feel like, oh, he killed himself, but there's no note. Maybe I just take one of his old journal pages, add some shit to make it seem like he loved us, you know, because uh, she wants him to be presented in that light. I mean, this guy had tons of journals and notebooks. He was constantly just writing down his thoughts. Or well, that's shit. that's that lends itself to a lot of the conspiracy theorists take on that is like this all the way up until the the writing gets weird sounds just like a normal curt letter angsty written with guilt and disconnection from his fans and hounded by the media and you know i mean I'll, hold on i'll read some 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 of his letter here sure uh speaking uh, to to bada which is his imaginary friend when he was a kid speaking from the tongue of an experienced simpleton who obviously would be rather would rather be an emasculated infantile complainee this note should be pretty easy to understand. All the warnings from Punk Rock 101 courses over the years since my first introduction to the, shall we say, ethics involved with independence and the embracement of your community have proven to be very true. It's just, you know... I'll, this I'll is skip, not a suicide right, note, I'll, dude. Sk- I'll skip ahead. Um, for example, we're backstage <coughs> and the lights go out and the manic roar of the crowd begins. It doesn't affect me the way uh, which it did for Freddie Mercury, who seemed to love relish in the love and adoration from the crowd which is something i totally admire and envy the fact is i can't fool you any one of you it's simple uh it isn't fair to you or me the worst crime i can think of would be to rip people off by faking it and pretending as if i'm having 100 percent fun <laughs> sometimes i feel as if i should have a punch in time clock within my power to appreciate it and I do this sounds like a guy who's just working out some issues it doesn't come across like I'm in it all fuck this and then the last few lines are um, well he actually ends the note so the last paragraph of the note before it gets weird is thank you from the pit of my burning nausea stomach for your letters of concern during the last years I'm too much of an erratic moody baby I don't have the passion anymore, and so remember, it's better to burn out than to fade away. Peace, love, empathy, Kurt Cobain. And then it gets weird. 
Francis and Courtney, I'll be at your altar. Please keep going, Courtney, for Francis, for her life, which will be so much happier without me. I love you. I love you. And that's it. You know, I can see it from both angles, but at the same time, it's really hard when you just don't have anything definitive. You have all these you have you have these breadcrumbs that make you go I mean, do you think uh, let me ask you this, Scotty, cuz you're a rational dude. Do you think just hearing the basics would you be willing to say that it warrants a reinvestigation? Oh, yeah. Well, the Seattle PD fucking refuses to do it. Well, I, I don't agree with that decision. <laughs> so, that's part of what's whole, I mean, that's part of what's <laughs> keeping guys if, from like you and me from knowing what actually happened because the Seattle PD faced with all the shit that I just told you refuses to take another look uh, at the case. I, I definitely don't agree with that. I mean, look, Kurt Cobain was a guy with a lot of cognitive dissonance going on. He oscillated from di- totally different points of view. He was an ever-evolving, complex person. I mean, more so than most people, especially in the world he lived in and created. I mean, it was one thing about Kurt Cobain that, that I've ever taken away from. It was someone that had such an imagination that it would just blind most people, just to, be, if, just to look at it. And th- th- I think the thing here is is that I could see him writing this letter and everything changing within him. I could see that as po- being possible, but I, but I don't know. I mean, here's a guy presenting right. another idea. Maybe he wrote the letter, got high for a few hours or days, who knows, then realized he was going to go through with it, then added it. So basically saying, yeah, like, yeah. he wrote this as a journal entry and then just kind of contemplated it, did some drugs, and came back, high as fuck, added, this, just, added this shit in yeah. a more chicken scratch kind of scrawl because, you know, I mean, his he had bad handwriting in, in general, but, like, the handwriting looks different because he's fucked up on heroin writing it. Could be. Ah, please, yeah, I'm in it all. Goodbye, you know? So, I mean, uh, you know, that's... Maybe not. Maybe that's not the most likely explanation, but that is a fucking possible explanation. So while we're uh, waiting for that uh, poll to cook, do you want? Yeah. Do you want to take a look at Kurt's broads? Sure. We took a look at Manson's yeah, broads. I like that about your Manson coverage. So yeah. I, I mean, I mean, like, look. Let's on, be real. Go, go, go to go some to the next one. The next to one. Some extent, yeah, there's yeah. like a uh, there's a thing of um, you know, uh, you become a rock star to get laid. You <laughs> I'm know. S- I'm sorry. I, I I have to laugh at this question. Who is Kurt Cobain dating right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. Uh, no, no, <coughs> so, no, no website. I no, can't no. read these very well, TJ. So if All you right, could I feel can make these. them a little bigger here if you want. Oh yeah. Uh, that, that, okay, yeah. We're so gonna, here's. I don't know if this is. Are these in order or? These are not in order. Um, but these are just women that he was known to have dated. All right, so he stopped this bitch. Yep. Wow. Kristen she, Pfaff. And she actually died the same year as him. Whoa. Yeah. Crazy. She was a bassist and backing vocalist for Minneapolis-based band Janitor Joe, I guess. So there you go, Jane Crowley, who there's no picture of. And she was on. She was in Hole. Damn, and she died. She from- was a young, uh, a young person that was involved with them. And so she was, died in '96. Damn, yeah. people don't. There's not a good fucking track record. No. The so Kurt Cobain's dick curse. Yeah, uh, Mary Lou Lord. Uh, according to Dave Grohl, an entire the entire relationship with Cobain consisted of her performing fellatio on him in a parked bus in Boston's uh, Kenmore Square. I mean, that's a, seems that's like a right. seems like a good relationship. Um, Courtney Love, we've just talked about. Yeah, I think we know that. Um, Toby Vale, we Toby also vale, talked we about. We talked about as well. And uh, Tracy Miranda, uh, his girlfriend. See, Brina this was Vaughan. the one I had up as uh, Toby Vale earlier because it was labeled oh, yeah. that way. They look very similar. I don't know. Maybe the person who labeled that one didn't yeah, know. It but I, I pulled that, so it just might have been my my bad. Well, no, the website listed it. As oh, really? Listed this picture as Toby Vale. This, I mean, it, it could be this website is wrong. This one it thinks he's this one thinks he's still alive. So, yeah, so yeah, maybe this website. <laughs> I, mean, I, I have to say, Manson wins this round, dude. Uh, well, yeah, uh, well, yeah. I mean, he did. look. I mean, Courtney Love. Us. Courtney Love is a pretty good looking chick back she in the was day. Back, the, back in the day. I mean, she always looked drugged I, out and I've shit. I've never. Uh, that, no, I don't really think Courtney. Love. Well, you but, pull up a picture of Courtney, uh, a hot I've, picture of Courtney I've, Love from her from the top of her fucking career. Dude. Come on. I, I, look, I, I've seen Courtney Love in her, in her prime, and I just never. Let's see it, TJ. I mean, look. I, know, I want look at her in the early er- hot ass Courtney Love uh, and tell her I, tell me he wouldn't stup it. I wouldn't, dude. What about the early days of you know like fucking um. Hole. Yeah. Ugh, no, I mean, like, but I, I'm not. I, I hate Hole one, and I just think Courtney Love is hideous. I mean, her acting career and shit too, you know. Oh, she was in the um, that she, last last time I saw her in, was um 
What was her? Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, she was in The People vs. Larry. Dude, Taylor. she's got these she's big... Really good. She's got... Oh, my God. She's had so much work done now. Yeah, let's... No, look at an, a younger picture of her when she was... <laughs> I mean, all the pictures let's, that are coming up are of her. Let's show the... Uh, let's show the uh, all right, all right, all right. I mean, the young and the old. Let's do both. Yeah. So, yeah, all right. I, I, I totally agree with modern Courtney Love. She looks like a monster that crawled out of a lagoon somewhere. Crawled out of heroin swamp. That's, that's living that uh, L.A. plastic surgery. Yeah. So, Botox. Get your, get your fucking... Uh, it's, it's hard to find old pictures of her, honestly. Okay. Uh, let me just fucking type a year in. She gets in. some Botox, TJ. Yeah, Courtney Love, like, like Courtney what Love year? Like 1996 or 97. Yeah, that'll do. Yeah, there we go. I know one percent you never get. Let's see if I can get a full body shot here. Would you bang Courtney Love, TJ? At least 1994 Courtney Love. <laughs> yeah. Here, here she, you know, it's, it's like she kind of... a. Uh, in that uh, that role with um, L- Larry Flint role, yeah. watching her deteriorate as the movie goes on, yeah, it was kind of like the same. Um, I don't know. Here we go. This is like a fucking picture of her at the time. It's not like a fashion shoot picture. This is just her on stage. But sure, we can get an idea at least. You know, whatever. Yeah, dude, she was a Betty. Look at her. Ugh, dude, I just fucking. I mean, maybe my mind has been so poisoned from the years of that, but I personally just don't find her attractive. What about Courtney Love in 2018, though? What does she look like? Oh, no, dude. Scary. Well, you know what? That's a good segue, TJ. You want to just go to that last story? Well, hold on. Let's just take a look first. It's got a modern picture of her. (laughs) Not as as good as this modern picture. Oh, my God. So that's her (laughs) with uh, Francis Bean and Francis's now ex-husband, I believe. There you go. So, yeah, I'll pull up that uh, story you pulled yeah. up here. Yeah, there's a picture of her. Oh. So I, I was actually doing research for this last night and stumbled on this. Courtney Love is being sued by Francis Bean Cobain's ex-husband for an alleged kidnapping and murder plot. Hmm. So <coughs> if you could blow it up a little bit for me. Like, just so I can read. Or you can read it if you'd like. You can take this one. Uh, So, Courtney Love is being sued by her daughter's ex-husband, alleging she conspired to have him murdered over ownership of her late husband, Kurt Cobain's 1959 Martin D-18E guitar that was used during Nirvana's iconic MTV Unplugged in New York performance in 93. So, similar to OJ's plight. Hey, you got some shit that's mine, bitch. Give it. Um... Along with others, Sam Lutfi, who managed uh, Britney Spears during her public meltdown uh, in 2007. Not, not a very good manager, huh? <laughs> uh, is also named in the suit and accused of supplying illicit drugs to Love's daughter, Frances Bean Cobain, which I don't think should matter because Frances Bean would have been an uh, adult at the time that this happened, but whatever. As well as kidnapping, attempted murder, false imprisonment, imprisonment, extortion, and more. Actor Ross Butler, star of 13 Reasons Why, is also accused of playing a role. According to the uh, uh, civil complaint filed in L.A. County, Love, Lutfi, and Butler entered into a criminal conspiracy to commit trespass, burglary, home invasion, robbery, assault, battery, kidnapping, and murder against Silva, all in order to take possession of the guitar, which is believed to be worth millions of dollars. Okay. Um, one that I can say is, is that I know that Courtney Love got most of that estate and a lot of that Nirvana royalty, so I don't think she's hurting for money. Well, I mean, who the fuck knows? I mean, I, I don't mean, know what her finances are. But you can I, spend it. You, I would venture If you make that money, you can spend it. And she's oh, a fucking yeah. co-core John, with John, a bunch of... Dude, Johnny Depp is proof of that. I mean, he's made over hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's broke Mike Tyson. Another guy made $400 million broke. So uh, I agree with that's possible, but royalties come in continuously, and this shit still sells continuously. Yeah. Uh, so a source of the family told Billboard, Francis and the family are prepared to fight with a fury of unprecedented legal force, and they will prevail. Damn, dude. Uh, since Cobain filed for divorce from Silva, this is Francis Bean Cobain, Cobain uh, filed for divorce from Silva in 2016, the guitar has been the subject of public interest and a point of contention in the couple's settlement. The rare acoustic electric 1959 Martin D-18E was produced for just a year before being discontinued, and the left-handed Kurt Cobain had it had its bridge and nut adapted so he could play it upside down. Once again, playing a, a left-handed guitar right-handed like he played a right-handed guitar left-handed. Um, as the press uh, has followed the matter over the past couple of years, Love has spoken out 
on the subject, calling it a treasured heirloom of the family and saying it's not Silva's to take. But according to the suit, the guitar was gifted to Silva by Cobain in a 2014 in 2014, six months before their wedding, as a dating anniversary present, marking a sentimental time in their turbulent relationship. The documents go into great depth, detailing Silva's gift to Cobain. Blah 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 blah. So, so they gave him a guitar as a gift, right? Um, before so they even got married, and then they're trying to get the guitar back, and it's alleged that they did all this underhanded shit and were plotting to, like, you know, burglarize right. and so scroll, get the guitar and, kick, and, you know, kill him and all this shit. I think there's a little more about that. Scroll down. Yeah. Uh, yet, hold on, go up a little. Yeah, there we go. Yet, according to Silva's suit, once Love and her business manager and so-called Rottweiler Lutfi got involved, the battle over the guitar, along with some property rights, became life-threatening. Silva and Cobain began dating in 2010, blah, blah, blah. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, so he's alleging that she developed, that uh, Francis Bean developed an addiction, which was supported by Lutfi, causing a great strain to their relationship and resulting in Silva ending their engagement at one point. Um, then go down. As so Let's see. From there, Love, Lutfi, Butler, and a chauffeur named Jan Yuchtman. Yuchtman. Allegedly hacked into Silva's iMessage account and sent out messages making it appear Silva was despondent and on a mental precipice contemplating suicide. This was allegedly part of a plan to commit a home invasion, kidnap Silva, murder him, make it appear to be a suicide, and recover the guitar. Well, that, well, that doesn't make any sense. Commit a home invasion... Kidnap him, but then make it look like suicide. That just doesn't make any sense. Well, if you, what if what if they did this? What if they kidnapped him and shot him up with a bunch of heroin and then put a shotgun yeah, in his mouth you and know, laid it on him? How about I that? mean, this th- this case to me reeks of I want to get paid. I mean, look, not saying it's totally. I mean, I impossible. I mean, this I don't Silva know. guy. It's a legal case. We don't know the truth of it yet. This Silva guy could be. Uh, Weaving this this story because he knows or, that there's already these allegations against or her. Or this too, could though. be a pattern of behavior right. for Courtney Love. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Silver reported the suspicious. Oh, hold on, let's see how he figured out this was going to happen. This was allegedly part of a plan. Blah blah blah. Um, yeah, Arlo uh, Silva reported the suspicious activity to the Los Angeles Police Department, Police Department, noting, according to the suit, that it follows a disturbingly similar pattern and course of conduct to the modus operandi of Lutfi in various previous harassment cases. From there, things worsen as Lutfi and Love allegedly began threatening Silva's friends, family, and bandmates in an attempt to turn them against Silva. So there's a lot going on here. There's some dirty shit. Let's, yeah, uh, Silva. Let's see. Following some, let's see, um, Lutfi allegedly yelled at and threatened a friend of Silva's, telling him to leave before Butler and Yuckman pushed him out of the house. Following some struggling, um, the documents continue, Silva was overpowered and then threatened to calm down by Lutfi, grabbing Silva's genitals through his pants and wh- whispered to Silva, listen, faggot, calm the fuck down or we'll drag you upstairs and take f- turns fucking you. In fear for his life, Silva uh, tried to appear calm and cooperative. However, he claims Lutfi, Butler, and Yuchtman continued to threaten him and physically removed Silva from his Curzon Avenue residence against his will, forcing him into the back seat of a Cadillac Escalade outside and driving off. Silva's friend had been outside dialing 911 from his car um, and was able to drive ahead of the Escalade, blocking its way uh, on the narrow canyon road, trying to prevent Silver's captors from getting away, the suit claims. When police arrived in cars and a helicopter overhead, Silva claims Lutfi hurriedly concocted a false story intended to prevent LAPD from <coughs> arresting them and threaten the lives of Silva's family, including his seven-year-old daughter, Arlo, if he didn't go along with it. So... So they're they're alleging that the kidnapping actually took place then. Right. Yeah, so he's saying that he... he okay, so he goes along with it at the The kidnapping time. is more than I just mean, a plan. He's saying it's, that when he got pulled over by the cops and he's in the back of this fucking car, the cops show up, right? They told him, hey, you don't go along with our fucking story. One of us is going to go murder your fucking family tonight. And then they concocted a story. That's what he's claiming. I mean, but the people right. threatened him are right there. 
I mean, I don't know. No, they're in the car as the cops are pulling up. No, no I know. I'm saying, but they're right there with him. So, right. I mean, if he says these, they're probably going to be arrested at that point, right? Essentially, maybe. Well, no. They, he says that they can talk, concocted a story that allowed them to get off scot free. Well, yeah, but he went along. He, he, and he but, went along with it. He went along with it. Right. Uh, he said because he's he now fear. saying he went along with it because he was afraid they were going to kill his family. Well, I mean, if there's evidence of all this hacking, all this, I mean, there's a yeah. lot of things there should be evidence of that. Sure. There should, shouldn't there still I mean, be a criminal investigation? this is a late breaking shit that just came out like yesterday. So I mean, who knows hey, what the fucking maybe, truth maybe is. Maybe he's telling the truth. I don't know. I wasn't there. I'm just saying you have to question any story you hear. I'm not just going to read any is story. It's a long. Just, oh, yeah, for sure. Who knows? And, and just take a carte blanche and go, okay, these guy must be telling the truth, though. They must be. Not. It's a long, interesting story. You guys can look it up. Yeah, it's on. Uh, it this is on billboard.com. I mean, so this is now. not like a schlocky thing. It's everywhere now. Yeah. So yeah. you could read the story yourselves and uh, judge. Uh, it's definitely an interesting yeah. story. An interesting development. Is it this guy using the existent narrative about Courtney Love to frame this this way because he thinks it'll be more believed if it seems like a pattern of behavior, or yeah. is it just actually a pattern of behavior? Uh, well, I hope maybe the court will figure that out. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, this might be interesting because if she's found liable for this shit... It then opened, it, it kind a, of opens. It kind of puts mark. another big punctuation mark after the question mark of did she kill him? Right. Did she have him killed? Um, our audience seems to think that uh, I don't know. I didn't ask them specifically if Kurt, Courtney did it, but it seems like the majority think he was killed. Wow. Forty-one uh, votes for killed himself. Ninety-seven votes for was killed. Forty-six votes for don't know. Um, so those people still kind of looking for more evidence, I, but I, I, my, I mean, my opinion, more people believe he was than wasn't killed it's among the people to watching the show. Too, that the don't know people are implicitly questioning the official police story too. Right. So when you have so those you can put the vast major, you can yeah, put it, the vast majority of the, these people in questions the official well, narrative. I mean, in my mind. The only really the only real answer is unless you're someone involved close closely associated with him is you don't know. I mean, look, maybe he was murdered, maybe he wasn't. But I mean, to me, I have to see concrete evidence one way or the other. I I, I need that. I literally need, you know need the smoking gun. I need something that says this is what happened for me to say why well, I officially believe he was sure. killed. No, There's I a tremendous too. amount of circumstantial evidence but, yeah, but, that. Well, but, you know, how, how can we even question there should be an investigation? That, to me personally, I think there needs to be one. The, just with what we covered tonight, yeah. that's not the balance of it either. There's more shit. I mean, like on the weight of the evidence, the Seattle Police Department or the federal government should step in and reinvestigate this fucking case. Because um, if someone like if Courtney Love is responsible for this, I mean, she's free. Yeah, she, well, now she's free. She's free to keep this this kind right. of. Well, I mean, look, I mean, even if she is guilty. Another investigation might not yield strong enough evidence to convict her of the crime. That's sure. true. Like because uh, it you might know, say that it points this has been investigated, defense. and uh, you know privately, obviously not with the resources of the police department. But the guy has found a lot of stuff that questions the official narrative, but he has not found a smoking gun that says Courtney Love absolutely did this. How many cold cases, like, you know, me and TJ, and I think all of us here have watched a lot of forensic files, and there's cases that take 25, 30 years, and, like, the detective's like, you know, I really want to solve this case. Oh, dude, there are cold cases that are never solved. I mean, oh, of the, the ones that have shows about them are often the ones that are solved. But, I'm saying, the but, ones that are there's, s- but there's way crazier stories, is what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. that it's like, it's a miracle that this person, that this was ever solved because they dumped the body in some field. The big problem is this is not even an open case at this point. Right. It, they're just Everybody's refusing to take a look at it. The Let's Seattle just, DP, D, uh, PD is obstinate about not even... They're, they're like, nope, don't see enough evidence. We're happy with the investigators. The investigation was done properly and professionally, and, and we're fine with it. Nope, not going to do it. I denied, 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 denied. There's so many good nonsense. reasons to question the official narrative here. Um, I don't know what I believe. I don't. I think I'm in. I'd probably be in the don't know category if I was voting, but I certainly think there's enough to warrant reopening the case for oh, another investigation. Yes. Easily yeah, for me. No, that, in my mind, that's not even a question. Not what, even. I mean, even if you don't, even well, here, here's the thing. Even if you believe he killed himself, what's the harm in really looking into it further? Yeah, well, if they uh, look at the evidence, questions. if they investigate it thoroughly and look at all the shit and find that they still believe that he killed himself, then it, then release that. Yeah. But if they don't, you know what I mean. But if they don't, then no, I, and it's not only just that. Cor- if Court, because I don't, I'm not even alleging she's involved. 
She might not. Have it been. Might, maybe it was somebody else killed him. Maybe she had I mean, somebody else strong, kill him. I think you pretty strongly implicated Courtney Love. <laughs> well, I mean, whatever. I, I, she's I think if, she's. I think she's let's just say not as the gun. if if no. if Courtney yeah. Love if if Kurt Cobain was murdered, the prime suspect is Courtney Love. Yes. Right. I don't think she pulled the trigger, but I think that she instigate. I think that she hi- hired right. somebody or conspired with somebody to do it. Sure. Yes. Uh, but that. we don't know that. No. Um, it might have been somebody else. The point being, like. You got to keep an open mind about shit, and there's enough. Like, I wouldn't be a dude that's out there like, yeah, Kurt Cobain was killed if I didn't feel like there was some shit there that needed looking at. Uh, my, my honest answer is I don't know. I don't know uh, one way or the other what the truth is, but I'd like to know. With modern technology and yeah. modern fingerprint <laughs> stuff, we might be able to learn something about what happened that night. And it's more than just Courtney Love being a psychopath, possibly, and being out there and free to do it. Uh, Kurt Cobain is culturally significant to a lot of people. Right. We explore, I mean, like, you know. The and his life story is him committing band, suicide. You know? And if he didn't commit suicide, I think it's a slap in his face. And a slap in the face of people that will come along in generations after us and learn about him. To think that he stuck a gun in his mouth if he didn't. I mean, that's another thing is there are people who allege, who have alleged that Courtney Love approached them to kill her husband. As well. Uh, that guy, Il Duce, yeah. who was the lead singer of the, oh, fuck, he had this weird bondage metal band. The uh, what, the, what are they called? Do you remember? I don't. No. The Mothers of something, Sadism or some shit. Um, but yeah, he, but whatever, he's a weird, drugged he out, was. drunk dude. <laughs> it was kind of crazy, though, that... Uh, he alleged that and then died a few days later, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, the lifestyle these but guys... But once again, you know, pull up a picture of Il Duce. Right, exactly, yeah. I mean, he's a know. huge dude, did nothing but drink and snort cocaine his whole life. Yeah, so that's not exactly So it's just like, he could have died. It might have been just a circumstance, you know? Yeah. But yeah, he did say that... He did this interview with uh, this English, this British reporter that investigated the Kurt Cobain death and claimed that... Courtney Love had offered him several it's, thousand dollars to off Kurt. Well, it's, it's definitely not something, regardless of how, of how you feel about it, or if you just say, like you said, you just don't know. The possibility of investigation, I think, is something that really should happen. And I know maybe it's not relevant because the result is the same, and I kind of get that, too. I kind of get that point of view where it's like, well, he's dead. It doesn't matter. But I, I agree with you. I mean, for his memory and, and for the fact that people know him as this guy that is it, pretty much is most famous for that song and for killing himself at this right. point. He's this big rock star who was on top of the world who blew his brains out. Right. Because in most, the most rational people's minds, that just doesn't make any sense. Like, you have everything with that you're, you want to kill yourself, you want to be dead. Like, why would... Because most people strive their whole life to even have a yeah. modicum of, of success in their field. And honestly, yeah. amongst Kurt Cobain's close friends and family, there's a split, too. Some of them have complained, uh, have said uh, posthumously that he was pretty happy at that time in his life that the drug problem was a problem for him that he was might have been having issues with courtney and the marriage but otherwise was pretty well adjusted and there are some people saying oh yeah i was really pro- prone to depression and suicidal ideation but that's just all that, that all comes under perception you right know i mean like it, it, it's like you play the game telephone and you, and you have the message and by the time it gets to the last person it's the message has totally changed yeah it's just it's just a reflection of how people perceive reality maybe they saw him on a bad day it was the last time so in their, in their mind it's like he was in a bad spot maybe the last time the interaction they were was they had a great time so yeah. it's like he was doing wonderful like you don't really know what someone's perception what the thoughts they have going on and how they actually remembered him and how their brain captured yeah. that last interaction or the last thing that really formed that opinion well i hope this was fun like, I don't idolize Kurt the way that I think TJ idolizes Marilyn Manson, but um, it was fun for me to learn a little bit more about his life. I learned a lot of stuff that I just didn't know. You know, I haven't rapidly consumed every piece of information about Kurt that I can find. I just don't look at him. Yeah, when I was doing the Manson, when I was like... I mean, you were freeballing most yeah, of the time. Yeah, I was, and uh, the other thing is, like, there was so much that I just left out for time. Like, oh, I had too. to, I had to cut down shit so much Oh, time. me too, man. I cut tons of stuff. I mean, this is definitely... We could do a whole episode just on the conspiracy theories alone, because there's oh, so yeah. many other ones. Sure. And we, um, I, mean, someone, well, I mean, we could, like... You could make entire episodes of this show about individual albums oh, from yeah. these guys, well, for sure. honestly. I mean, especially with Kurt Cobain, dude, there's so much media about him. There's, he was such a... I mean, he, he's a public figure this day, despite be, being dead for, you know, 24 years. Yeah, it sucks that, you know, I couldn't put more fucking... 
videos. I mean, I would love to do shows like this where, you know, we do the Manson show and we get to listen to some of these songs of T that are TJ's favorites or whatever. You know, we get to watch some of these live performances, but doing that just risks our video being fucking DMCA. You know, maybe Paul, uh, I don't, I hate to propose this in front of the audience and everything, but maybe you and I could sit down and give and just record a, a video of us listening to some of our favorite songs from, uh, Kurt and you know uh, Manson, we could even make it a thing for the ten dollar people if you wanted. Oh, you know what, TJ? Be like an early thing that. for that them. Sounds you like know? a great thing to promise to the new ten dollar patrons. Yeah, so uh, this uh, is a great time to yeah, remind you, uh, you guys. You guys are getting first peek at this. The general public won't have, uh, won't even know about it until uh, Monday, really, unless yeah. they check the Patreon. Um, well, so, I, I, TJ, I feel it's a little bit uh, premature, dude. What's premature? Because, you know... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I feel it's a little pretty much... I think you understand now why we're... Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We could wait on that, but... Yeah, we should probably wait on that a little while. But, uh... But for good reasons, for good reasons. Yeah, maybe we'll do that after Monday, because there might be some other... You know, I don't know. Oh, no, yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's a great idea, and we might all three sit down and, yeah, and talk uh, about some stuff. So. Paul, I picked a musician. Paul picked a musician. I don't think it's spoiling too much to say that Scotty also has a musician. I mean, you know, we, I'd like to ask you guys to keep it under your hat. I know you won't. We usually don't announce the tone and, and stuff of the show. But, yes, uh, Monday's show will be another musician. Scotty will be uh, holding the reins. I won't tell you who it is. But if you want to you know wait. ahead of time what the shows are going to be, the $10 patron slot is uh, for you. That's part of it. There's I will say this. If, if you've listened to what the, some comments I've made on the last couple of shows, you might you might figure it out. Oh, yeah. I will for say sure. that. I will no, say you're that. giving them too many hints now. All right. Uh, we're yeah. going to we're gonna end this. Thank you guys for watching. Yep. Good night, uh, we love Peace. you all, except for, uh, except for Jay Darkey, dude. dude. Jay Darkey. Fuck him. Ugh. Fuck Jay Darkey. Hate the guy. Blech. Terrible. Hate garbage. that guy. I don't even know why he's a mod in here, you know? I modded him out of pity, honestly. Ban him. Yeah, it's just like, Ban he ain't got him. nothing else in his life. What a wretch. Might as well be modded. All right, Give thank you guys wretch. for watching. We love you. Goodbye. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you decided to become a patron. I'm not going to belabor the point anymore. It's down there. You know where it is. Please do it. Bye.